Sure, there's several arcs in this series. You have the theatrical ones, then you've got the direct-to-video ones, which were an existing script that they just inserted Pinhead into, then you got the Doug Bradley-less ones, and the obligatory reboot, but the real arc is me calling Kirsty Christie in the first one, and then using that as an ongoing joke. At least in uh, the first few, so enjoy. See, what did I tell you in the last review? I said that Freddy was a gateway drug to Pinhead, and here I am talking about Hellraiser. I ran out of Freddy movies to talk about, so this drug had better be worth it. There's like ten of these movies. Also, I'm on crack. Pay attention, because I seriously doubt any of you have really heard of the Hellraiser movies. So the information I'm giving you right now is definitely gonna be news to all of you. For instance, did you know that writer-director Clive Barker, clearly a very little-known horror maestro, based this film off of his novella The Hellbound Heart? Lies! That's the book that inspired Apocalypse Now. Everyone knows that. Produced by Christopher Figg along with New World Pictures, Barker chose to throw himself in as director after being seriously disappointed by previous adaptations of his work. Agreed, Explorers was nothing like Lord of Illusions. The film was made under the working title of Sadomasochist from Beyond the Grave, clearly as a secret sequel to Oversexed Rug Suckers from Mars. The film is the very simple story of a man named Frank who has his flesh torn off from opening a puzzle box and then his ex Julia, played by Claire Higgins, must bring him victims to regrow his flesh taken by the Cenobites, which are Hell's theologians of the Order of the Gash. <laughs> That's too complicated. Go back to movies about driller killers slaughtering frolicking slumber party girls. The breakout star of the series certainly became Pinhead, portrayed by Doug Bradley, and only known here as Lead Cenobite, before then changing his name to Fake Shemp, then to The Shape, and then to Pinhead. The critics tell me that this is indeed a fine film, but the half-star review from Ebert means that I'll hate it. But others say it's the best horror ever to be made in Britain. Oh, that's only because you haven't seen A Little Princess. But more famously, Stephen King is quoted as saying, I have seen the future of horror fiction, and his name is Clive Barker. Yes, but he also said that about the commercials for the McDonald's salad shakers. That quote's even on the main poster, where the movie also advertises its NES tie-in, Pinhead's Birthday Blowout. Guess we might as well watch the first film while we kill time waiting for the entry that takes place in outer space. Why does it say introducing Ashley Lawrence? I've seen her in plenty of movies that were made after this. The Christopher Young music is getting me pumped. This is kind of like the opening credits to Windy City, only with the promise of something happening. Fantastic. Now I already know what's in the puzzle. It's a director's credit. What's your pleasure, Mr. Cotton? The box. Then he brings the box home to Billy from Gremlins. This here is Frank, who's full of bad ideas. I know that you may think opening the box is going to turn you into the Punisher, but you're going to be really sorry when your fear of sharp objects sets in. The puzzle doesn't seem so hard, it's kind of solving itself. I appreciate that this is a series that's already starting out with the Thorn Cult. 
this is why they decided it was best to not make Rubik the Amazing Cube a medieval torturer. Worse yet, opening the box really messes up your house. It's much easier to stick hooks in your jaw than clean this place. Don't even get me started on this section of the house. It may smell like delicious pulled pork for a while, but you'll eventually get maggots. And there he is, the albino from Black Rage. Uh, I mean, Pinhead. Uh, I mean, lead Cenobite. Fine day to be moving into this place. This is Larry and Julia. Thankfully, they've moved in after they got rid of the chopped up face smell. You know the house is crazy when you're relieved that Scorpio from Dirty Harry shows up. See, told you, maggots. Uh, still looks promising compared to this slaughterhouse. We can make it work here. Uh, I've got a terrific job. You're back on your own turf. I can't put my finger on it, but I have a sneaking suspicion that Andy Robinson is playing Jerry from The Stepfather. This place is terrible. We asked for twin squatters mattresses. Now let me catch you up on this. Larry here is Frank's brother, and after Larry married Julia, she and Frank had a passionate love affair. And then Cenobites of Mutilation. <laughs> Days of Our Lives was graphic in the 80s. She still misses him, though, as she reminisces about the time that Frank used to be Corey Hart. This place is a real keeper. So? Why not? Great. Mm, that's the exact same conversation my wife and I had when we settled on seeing Mortal Engines on a Thursday night. The move gives Larry a chance to recite his favorite Friends episode. Pivot! Pivot! Everyone loves moving. You got any beer? There's some in the fridge. Oh well. Why don't I get it? I got nothing better to do. Their passive aggressive lovemaking always ends with them making sarcastic remarks to each other's genitals. Meanwhile, Larry's daughter Christy walks to Chernobyl as she finds out exactly where the Cenobites came from. All you really needed to do to make the Amityville house more presentable was throw mud on it and take out all the crazy things that nuns use to scare kids and hire a different moving company. That your daughter? Uh huh. Got her mother's looks. Her mother's dead. Must be why she's making me stiff, bro! Interesting setup. Needs more soap opera flashbacks. Can I come in? Can I come in? Why does everything I watch Trojan horse a porn on me? Julia never looked hotter than when she went to the salon and asked for the Rod Stewart. I don't know if I trust anyone here. You know what these two need? A day at the spa. She and Frank have a strong desire to be the next Luke and Laura. What about Larry? Forget him. For a movie that started out with flesh being ripped apart, this is escalating quickly. And so are these cuts. <laughs> Larry often starts fucking mattresses when Julia has her flashbacks. He's stroking so hard he's gonna start chafing. Just, just take it easy, just take it easy. I don't know how to say this, but I think the blood is overacting a bit. But considering the self-cleaning house, they got a better deal here than they thought. There's never any getting used to these California earthquakes, though. Mm, I don't know how to tell you this, but I think your house has a heart condition or bone cancer. Even the rats want to get out of here, which reminds me, is anyone going to call an exterminator? The rats are lured into the attic because that's where the distinct raw T-bone smell is coming from. And it's away from the awkward dinner conversation. I am not kidding. This doctor is poking around with all the delicacy and compassion of Joseph Mengele, and I'm warning him, listen, I'm going to pass. Dad, stop with your pointless Mengele tangents. That's not even the most awkward thing that happens. Me, thanks. Okay. Okay, stop. I'm not going to be able to stand up. So lie down. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to get my daughter drunk and bang her. A dark, moldy attic is probably preferable to the mingle talk and drunk flirting. And that's with Frank, the skinless squatter. I said, 
Don't look. Help me. Frank's skin may be gone, but his dramatic line readings are very much intact. His blood on the floor, it brought me back. I see no reason to question this. This is why Renner's insurance was created. Hmm, I distinctly remember Frank having much more skin, but I do recall the sadomasochistic bastard always having a flayed penis. Frank needs more flesh and blood to get his skin back, and this lighting is giving evil Julia away. Hi. Must they always film me in Dynasty Bitch Vision? Well, things already seem exciting enough with Larry! Oh, you, oh. hmm. you know what? This marriage needs a skinless zombie in the attic who craves human flesh. Okay, fine. I'll bring you victims only because it smells like a slaughterhouse made of discarded anuses up here, and it'll only get worse. Meanwhile, in Christie's My Chemical Romance video, who needs Freddy to have some rockin' dream sequences? Your sheets are gonna be stained with blood regardless. I would have assumed this was all in the same house until she calls her dad. I'm all right, honey. I just wanted to make sure you were okay. Never better. Dad, stop drunk dialing. And why does it now smell like someone's making a stew out of old shrimp up here? Oh, sorry, Frank. The biggest message here is that the longer you spend in 1987, the more you will turn into Annie Lennox. Sir, don't you think this is too good to be true? Eh, screw it, she's drop-dead gorgeous. This'll be worth my flesh getting torn off to appease her lover. Good news, Frank will be getting some skin, but bad news, his hairline is really gonna suffer. Frank's real horror, though, is this view. You're very beautiful. God, this disgusting view is more painful than when I spilled salt on my full body open wound. Julia is sick and tired of everyone she brings home having a Joan Collins fetish. <laughs> Worth it! Frank, I would still advise you not to stand in direct sunlight. See? It's making me whole again. Sure, if your whole self was slim, good body. This is the sexiest romance I've seen since Robbie Williams' rock DJ video. Never has so little skin had such sex appeal. This is a set of vampire teeth, a lesbian, and a David Bowie away from being the hunger levels of sexy. Take me now, Frank. You know how much I love the smell of fresh-cut salmon. Mmm, -hmm -hmm. Tastes like mini hot dogs dipped in sweet and sour. All right, Christy, I forgot you were in this. What are you doing? For the last time, Rob Zombie, you're not remaking this movie. And stop starving the iguanas. Not only is Frank's skin improving, but so are his victims' hairlines. Great, guess I'm out. Eh, but Julie is still so sexy, so worth it. With any luck, with each passing victim, Julia can now take her true form as Sigourney Weaver from Working Girl. And Frank can be his true form, Red Skull. You promised me an explanation. I've seen almost 500 movies for this show, and not a single time has that ever been promised. And you may be jumping the gun on whether or not you're ready for clothes. Have you seen our dry cleaning bill? I'm halfway through this movie. Where the hell is Pumpkinhead at? Oh, thank God, he remembered their anniversary. It opens doors. What kind of doors? It's a doorknob. And in case you wanted to remember how much more handsome he is with skin... The Cenobites gave me an experience beyond the limits. Pain and pleasure. <laughs> yeah, they taught him to jerk off with a rope around his neck. Most uncomfortable thing about the torture? It's really, really chilly in there. Okay, fine. Thanks, Frank. I'll make sure to re-gift this at a baby shower. I wonder what Andy Robinson is doing. The hell? He's not even watching the movie anymore. And he's one of the lead actors. God damn it, honey. Are you keeping skinless former lovers in the attic again? You're lucky you got looks, dear.
See, everything's fine. Nobody from Black Christmas up in this attic. Worse yet, Frank is also a creeper. He tried very hard to masturbate, but quickly realized that, good God, that would sting. Honey, could you just stop thinking about rotting flesh when you make love to me? I just don't understand you. Uh, see, I knew it. I knew he was secretly Jerry Blake. Must every YA novel contain a love triangle? You can't love him. You know I don't. Uh, Frank, you got a little something on your, uh, your, uh, everywhere. This is diabolical. Not only is Julia cheating on Dad, but she's a real-life Patrick Nagel painting. Who <laughs> play it cool. So, does she just know that the sinister music is playing? Yep. Still worth it. Jesus Christ! <laughs> A literal devil's threesome. Talk about wrong place, wrong time. Who wants to see their stepmom kill for sex? <laughs> Bet you make your daddy so proud, don't you, beautiful? Gross. Uncle Frank was a mentor to Jackie Earl Haley's Freddy Krueger. And she doesn't even want his birthday present, but she'll take it anyway, not to be rude. Uh, hey, we lost some religious imagery. Have you seen it at your house? Uh, never mind. You know what she needs? A hospital vacation. You're awake. Okay, is this nurse high? What the hell is she watching that for? You should go to the hospital across town. It's playing nothing but the moody blues on their TVs. There you go, miss. This puzzle box is full of excellent morphine. Just don't take too much now. Sadly, once she opens it, the only thing that comes out is a copy of Wish Upon. And not to mention a gateway to the hospital burn ward! This is all definitely going on the hospital bill. Insurance doesn't cover opening the gates of hell. Or whatever this is. <laughs> Maybe being locked up in here isn't so bad. It's nice not having to deal with the leftover creatures from Dune. Unfortunately, the Cenobites arrive, including the very chilly cousin of the monster from House by the Cemetery and the ghost of an old blues musician. But now we can finally hear that legendary menacing voice of Doug Bradley as Pinhead. We'll tear your soul apart! Uh... The hell? I seem to recall his voice being more terrifying than that. Mm, let's try this again. Who are you? Explorers in the further regions of experience. Demons to some. Mmm, better. But this is where Star Trek The Next Generation lost me. Only thing I'm taking away from this is that someone is gonna bang that neck. Christy offers them Frank in return for life, but they really need to consider warning the customers what happens before opening the box. Just add some fine print about the sadomasochism. Anything! Christy's too late, though. Larry is now Frank, who is doomed to an eternity of banging with his brother's penis. While I appreciate, dear, that you haven't asked me about the blood on my head, I assure you I'm not evil. He was insane, baby. A mad dog. I had to put him out of his misery. Ah, oh, great. Dad Scorpio again. Also, we decided to turn the house into a smokehouse. Cut yourself off a slice. We already have our regular customers. We want the man who did this. You want effects artist Bob Keen and his crew? Well, okay. The movie begins killing off its heroes! No sexiest, murderous adulteress who ever lived, no! And you didn't even clean out this house all the way! Oh, that's what the nuns were coming back for. After all of this, dealing with rude customers at the pet shop is gonna be a breeze. While I again appreciate this is the alternate universe where Andy Robinson was Terry O'Quinn, what I really want to see is the Cenobites Christmas caroling. Don't know why, I just do. No one leaves our death metal band and gets away with it. This is what Eric Holmberg from the Hell's Bells documentary thinks that all rock music is. At least this band actually quotes scripture. Pizza soup. What? Ew. Heartburn. 
This may be the end of Frank, but Kelly Preston from Battlefield Earth is not letting Christy get out of here just yet. There's still 10 minutes of the movie left. We're gonna need this box for the onslaught of sequels. We have such sights to show you. The second film really does have some amazing special effects, but we need to wrap this film up, so back in the box, where they were never seen or heard from again. And on the Chatterer's wedding day, too. Harsh. And you, get back to Arrakis, you bastard. This hell box is never gonna end up in a child's happy meal ever again. Or at least that's what would have happened if not for Chester A. Bum. <laughs> Fine, I'll give you some change. Just put that shit back in the fire. <laughs> I'm sure this flying hell beast could find some kind of job. And then the box is back and we'll return in Gremlins 2. Oh, uh, wait, I'm confusing my 80s movies again. <laughs> Naturally, the movie was such a success that for the past 10 years or more, a remake of the film has been in production limbo. From being passed through Clive Barker again, to Todd Farmer and Patrick Lussier, to Julian Mari and Alexander Bastillo, with the general vibe being that studios at one time were wanting a more PG-13 friendly Hellraiser film, causing some filmmakers to depart. Oh, why'd you leave that project? That movie would have been pathetic! But why talk about a remake that will possibly never happen? when we have loads of sequels to get to, such as Hellbound Hellraiser 2, which was only released one year after the first Hellraiser. And one of these Hellraiser movies better be a biopic on Motorhead, because why else would it share the name of one of their songs? <laughs> you want a cookie, little girl? With the success of the first Hellraiser movie being such a success, <laughs> whoa, that was a badly written sentence. <laughs> One year later, in 1988, we got a sequel to the original Hellraiser film from 1987. Or as it says on YouTube from 1984, I remember the first one vividly. It was the story of 80s fashion model Julia and her charitable work of feeding and clothing skinless squatters until taken down by her no good husband, who was secretly the Scorpio killer of the 1970s, whose skills at the Rubik's Cube brought to life a collection of Nika action figures. That about sums it up. The sequel brings back Ashley Lawrence as Christy, now fighting the undead Julia brought back by Bloody Mattress and given a tour of the new attraction at Universal Studios Florida. It takes the bold step of putting the subtitle before the title. I think the whole series goes something like this. Hellraiser, and then this film, Hellbound Hellraiser 2, followed by Hellbound 3, then John Hellbound, shortened to just Hellbound, followed by Last Hellraiser. I think I'm in good hands here. After all, Stephen King raves that he's seen the future of horror and is, uh, wait a minute, that's his same quote from the first movie. Stephen King's reviews are stuck in a time warp that he found in the back of a diner. I think Roger Ebert's are as well. He gave this film a half a star, just like he gave the first one. Which means I will simply be repeating my review of the first movie. Um, uh, something, 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 uh, boy, the chatterer sure looks chilly. Now let's find out who gave us this sequel. Ah, just kidding. That'd be my hell if I solved the puzzle box. While the original writer and director Clive Barker remained as producer, directing credits went to Tony Randall? Mm, I don't know. This feels more like an Oscar thing. <laughs> Way different Tony Randall. This one did effects on Escape from New York and directed a doggone adventure. Writing duties went to Peter Atkins. Makes sense given how he wrote the second cousin to Pinhead, the Wishmaster. Oh, you don't have to catch me up on what happened in the first film. I already summed it up correctly. I don't need to see scenes from people under the stairs. I feel like the first one already had a conclusion. <laughs> well, this was a short sequel. 
But never mind, we see part of the origin of Pinhead, who is a British military officer named Elliot Spencer. I don't know if I can handle seeing Pinhead without makeup. Holy shit, it's Robert England! Eh, sure, take the gamble that it might have chocolate in the middle. Or diamonds. Ah! Whoa, British war medals were hardcore back then. Meanwhile, Kristen is back in the nut house because it's the only way to keep her safe from the T-1000. And didn't she have a boyfriend in the first film? Steve. Uh, don't worry about him, he's okay. We sent him home hours ago. Well, that explains why he's not in the sequel, though it makes him look like kind of a dick for not at least checking in once. We've got our best people investigating. Detective Freddie Mercury is the perfect officer to call in when another one bites the dust. Unfortunately, he finds a skeleton, puts a gun against his head, pulls the trigger, now it's dead. All right, I'm out of queen jokes. Let's switch over to the brain that wouldn't die. This is Dr. Chenard, a man who's been searching for the box for years. Just go to a Chinese market, it's not that hard to find. If we are honest, it is the lure of the labyrinth that draws us to our chosen field to unlock those secrets. Did you get into the medical field to save lives or to host the Twilight Zone? Dr. Chenard is so dramatic, even the actor's IMDB page looks like it's saying, mm -hmm, yes. <laughs> Seriously, he reads every line like he's going for a Tony Award. Police brought her here hours ago, but she was lost beyond reach. And now she's back. What tales, I wonder, will she bring us from the other side? Okay, fine. You can play the title character in the hospital's production of Julius Caesar. I see this is one of those hospitals, like in glass, where you can just leave your room whenever. She has to see Tiffany, though, who likes building wooden boxes. Careful, when you open those, <laughs> you get splinters. Now get back to your room, slugger. It's always lights out past 1 a.m. I don't blame her for wanting to leave. This is one of those mental wards where, unfortunately, you have a roommate. Dr. Chenard starts out all his mornings by visiting the normal patients, then goes into the basement of the patients who are convinced they're in the Elm Street boiler room. Please! Get them off me! Ah, oh, success! He's finally learned to say please! Christine is given a prescription of 50 cc's of exposition, where even Larry and Julia's wedding looks like a soap opera. Oh yes, she will be mine. <laughs> and keep the comments to yourself. It was Julia, that bitch. Hey, you will respect your stepmother. Sure, it may say the movie is 97 minutes, but when you take out the clips from the first film, it's probably around 90. Yawn, wake me when you go full Silent Night, Deadly Night 2. This all seems normal. Am I crazy? That is not a word I choose to employ, Kirsty. Kirsty, I'm only here to ask your thoughts on my amazing James Mason impression. Little do they know that Dr. Chenard stole the bloody mattress to bring back Julia, as Dr. Kyle finds out. Weird. That's the appropriate reaction to finding a bloody mattress in someone's office. Now if you'll please take a shit on the mattress, it will cover up those ghastly blood stains. Here, slice yourself open and bleed to bring back Julia. And why aren't you stopping this? <laughs> okay, yeah, I'd stay hidden too. I'm not gonna clean up that mattress. Call a maid. See ya! Finally, the return of Claire Higgins as the diabolical Julia. Mmm, skinless and still sexy. I thought having an entirely white household was a bold choice, but boy, did I make a mistake. <laughs> Thanks, Julia. That means seven years tribulation, and I gotta go watch Left Behind 2. And look, I said the same thing to Frank, and I'm saying it to you, too. You're not ready for clothes yet.
I laid the red suit out for a reason, but uh, fine, the white will do. She even manages to stain the white wine. She's like a skinless version of a Robert Palmer video. I do her. There you go, now your wounds won't get infected. You should have thought of this before you ruined the white suit. Julie is now kicking herself for not thinking of bandaging Frank like this. That would have saved a mess in the attic. She's fulfilling his fantasy of having sex with the invisible man. My god, Julia, it's like sticking my fingers in a bowl of red cabbage. Now all we need is skin. Perfect! I've already skinned my dick from masturbating five times. Help yourself! All right, our hero is Crescenda. Now let's get you out of here. Shit! I'll get you close. I can do that. I'm a doctor. You need a medical license to fetch clothes for someone? He really underreacts to a lot of things. She was horrible. She had no skin. And she was really, really rude. Between staring at her in the shower and this, Dr. Kyle is no creepier than the other doctors. I know. Don't touch the patients. If you're looking for Julia, perhaps you should check the Gary Newman ward. Even skinless, Julia is stricken with a disease called 80s as hell. You know what they say, dying, losing your skin, and eating dead bodies is one way to come back to life with a fresh new haircut. You may think that Julia is doing something devious, but even she just simply wants a Lieutenant Gorman autograph from Aliens. I know this seems weird coming from a cinema snob, but I think this movie may be a little too hard on itself. Is it terrible? Yes. This is terrible. Okay, it's not that bad. I hear around part four is when it gets really terrible. As sexy as she looks, it's still far too soon for backless dresses. Uh, Kyle can help with that. <laughs> huh, weird. Julie is significantly more evil in this one, like graduating from Joan Collins to a Disney villain. No! Take your best shot, Snow White. <laughs> Anyway, I've adopted Tiffany as our daughter. Will you marry me, Julia? Best get Tiffany to solve the puzzle box. After all, she was literally in a movie called Dream Child. You're sure this is what you want? It's what I've always wanted. I have to see. I have to know. Oh, really, Dr. Chenard? I mean, who are you? Where the hell did you come from? And where is lead Cenobite Pinhead? I am halfway through this movie, and once again, I have yet to see any of the dolls from Puppet Master. This will solve everything. Tiffany has the gift of completing the world's easiest puzzles. <laughs> Just rub it a few times and wait for a storm. My god, Julia, we've done it. We've brought back to life the Lucio Fulci movie Manhattan Baby. I really hope the doctor has insurance. Now they can prepare for the coming of the Gozer Bites. The Cenobites are what Eric Holmberg from Hell's Bells thinks is the result of listening to too much rock music. And it's about time Pinhead got in this movie. I've been waiting patiently. It's not hands that call us. It is desire. What the hell? You still haven't perfected his voice yet? Hmm, they're either inside of the puzzle box or they're going on a tour of Eastern State Penitentiary. I don't know how this place could get any creepier. Oh, God, there's a carnival. Help my daughter. Good, the drugs I took are starting to kick in. Too bad I took them last week to get through Leprechaun 2, and they're just now starting to take effect. <laughs> Maybe that's why this looks like a medieval version of the Leprechaun's Cave. 
This film takes me back. <laughs> I had this movie hung up on my wall in college. It's unfortunate the Cenobites always appear on the windiest of days. That's just gonna make the chatterer even chillier. I don't know how. I just have a feeling that all of this has something to do with Detective Freddie Mercury. Well, you're gonna need that for the cock razor porno spoof. Oh sure, they're all smiles now. Wait until they realize they forgot their handbook for the recently deceased. Dr. Chenard is coming down with something too. It's a drug called the last act of Easy Rider. Come. I have such sights to show you. Just like when Pinhead said that in the first one. Only far more of a turn on in this film. This place is so huge, how is she gonna find Tiffany? Yeah, well, huh, that was easy. Sure, I could be impressed with the scale to which this movie handles its small budget, but where the hell is Jarrett the Goblin King? What kind of cult is this? But this is what you wanted. This is what you wanted to see. This is what you wanted to know. Okay, fine, Julia has convinced me. I belong to a new religion now. But there is a price to making out with Julia. <laughs> And you wanted to know. Worth it. Best hang back while Chrysler looks for her dad. That's a fire hazard, and I know a Laura Branigan video when I see one. I, I live among the creatures of the night. Look at the bright side, though. Uncle Creepy has his skin this time around. Oh, Daddy. Oh, come on, Kirsty, grow up. When you're dead, you're fucking dead. And there's significantly less ADR in his voice. Unfortunately, significantly more incest. Weird. Oh, what are you doing? He just got that new skin. He's gonna ruin another suit and another attic. But his undershirt is still fine. I'm glad to see the series power couple back together. Oh! Typical sexy gold digger takes his heart and the skin off his back. Meanwhile, Dr. Chenard's elevator has arrived. Or is that Uncle Fester caught in barbed wire? How are you less dramatic now than you were before? Anyway, this is how you masturbate now. You're truly in hell. Ooh, thank God Julie is still here. <laughs> well, neither me or my erection care anymore. <laughs> See? <laughs> Flat. They're gonna be stuck in here forever. Tiffany, we're getting out of here. Well, that was also easy. Unfortunately, the hospital is superimposed on the gates of hell, which is only bad for Dr. Jetson. Chain, stop this crazy thing! Despite getting a name this time around, rest assured, Pinhead is still the lead Cenobite. And your suffering will be legendary, even in hell. Uh, she'll be fine. She's only in one other Hellraiser movie after this. But when you're this deep into a cult, a little reverse brainwashing will do the trick. I remember. That's nice, but really I just want an autographed headshot from you. Guess all it takes to turn them back into their former selves is a good old fashioned paper cut. Chatterer was once a young boy who wasn't chilly at all. He was quite cozy. Then Pinhead's an idiot and opens the box again and we get several more sequels. Or that happens. Doesn't matter, he'll still be in the next one. There's still craziness going on with this puzzle, but will someone do something to take care of these patients? They're chasing each other around with hatchets. Where'd they get those? They must have had them hidden in the best Metallica album cover ever. And you thought we were done with the flashbacks. These puzzles are consuming her life. Help me, doctor. Can you help my daughter? Can you help her? Any particular reason you're showing me scenes from pieces 
other than that movie's villain also doing a James Mason? Is it just me, or is this new Dark Crystal series really graphic? Thankfully, Julia shows back up before I make my very obvious Doc Ock or Edward Snake Knife Hands jokes. In my puzzle box of references, I'm sure there's also a joke about Tron in there somewhere. Maybe never-ending story. I don't know. People keep dying before I get to my jokes. I'm really sad. I'm also sad that given that we're living in Tim Burton's head right now, I'm very surprised there isn't a Danny Elfman soundtrack. Uh, hey, wait a minute. That's not Julie at all. You tricked my penis. Well, that was a bloody-ass Scooby-Doo episode. I feel like this is the fifth time that they've escaped this thing. Ooh, ooh. Sounds like the light got its finger stuck. Now that everything is better, it's best to take this one day at a time. First a hedge maze, and then we'll return to the final scene from the beyond. Also, I've adopted you now. This really is a happy ending. Dr. Chenard got all the blood stains out. Or did he? What is your pleasure, sir? And then Christy became Kirsty and married Dean Winters and sent him to hell. But that's not for several movies later. Given how truly gorgeous the movie looks, it's a movie that looks like it should be projected onto a brick wall at a basement nightclub in a way that gives this a really unique vision unlike any of the other Hellraiser movies. The film got fairly decent reviews, such as, Move over, Freddy. Pinhead's the new horror icon. That's just meant to cause a divide in the great horror icon wars of the 80s. As for how well the film did, who cares? Obviously, it did well enough. There was another sequel four years later. Four years? What happened to just waiting one year? And given that this wait happened between 88 and 92, I blame H.W. Bush for the gap in the Hellraiser movies. Now, if you excuse me, I need to figure out how to open this puzzle box of crackers. It's going to get really horrifying because it's going to be filled with fingers and dicks. Or just crackers. And not even that either. Look, it's empty. It's fucking empty and I'm starving. A hundred and five years and he still doesn't know my name. Why is there a third Hellraiser, you may ask? Well, it's because Hellraisers 1 and 2 got over a hundred thousand views. Uh, uh, oh, wait a uh, you meant the movies, didn't you? <laughs> I thought you were talking about the reviews. Uh, sure, um, the first two movies made enough of a profit, so now there's a third movie. Titled Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth, that sets itself apart from the first two movies that took place on Mars. Originally envisioned by Clive Barker to also focus on the character of Julia, however, Claire Higgins declined to participate in further sequels, plus the movie had a troubled pre-production due to the bankruptcy of New World Pictures, so Barker had little involvement until post-production, plus Hellraiser 2 director Tony Randall, envisioning yet another odd couple joke, was removed by producers, although he served as co-writer along with Peter Atkins who also co-wrote Hellbound. Directing duties went to Anthony Hickox, previously of Waxwork 1 and 2. Sounds like a good recipe for a sequel, just don't make it too dark. Seriously, Randall was removed for his vision being too bleak. What? A Hellraiser movie? Bleak? And this original poster was declined for being way too intense. That was the right thing to do. It is a kid's movie, after all. So the poster was replaced by taking the poster of the first movie and putting Pinhead in front of New York. Makes sense. The poster for Hellbound used the same Stephen King quote as the first movie. As we see in the Jason Goes to Hell title card, this is Hell on Earth. Look at the first shot. See? There's a fire, and that is Earth. Let's see who our hero of this film is gonna be. <laughs> Cool points multiplied by 11. Oh, never mind. This is super not so fly. 
Here is J.P. Monroe, sleazy club owner and art dealer. He's interested in this pinhead piece. Not exactly sure how this happened. Let's just assume Pinhead owed money to Jabba the Hutt. Who on earth would make something like this? You want it? I'd love to buy this from you, Chris Christopherson. Not sure that this is the best Valentine's Day gift, but okay. Though here is our real hero, ace reporter Joey. It's a mystery to me. A mystery how those assholes at assignment knew it. Well, she's fired. We got an emergency, Joey. This review needs a Deep Space Nine reference stat, but I think the reviewer is only going to reference back to school. She needs a story. Luckily, this hospital is shot like a horror film. There's got to be something here. Ha, ah, good. A deleted scene from Unplanned. This'll do. <laughs> That is horrifying. We need to outlaw vaping immediately. Then the movie packs up and goes home. Well, you tried. This may be a surprise to you, Brad, but I want to do this the right way. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what? I didn't open the box. Why is the movie talking to me? Joey investigates the exploding body by going to a nightclub that's promoting the Hellraiser 3 soundtrack. This place looks hardcore. They booked all of the bands from Hell's Bells, The Dangers of Rock and Roll. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the back room, this place has the best soundproofing that I've ever seen. You can't even hear the metal bands while JP is Costas Mandaloring the hell out of the scene. I'm not sure where this is going. Anyway, back to Rob Zombie's platoon. Joey finds Terry, the girl from the hospital. <laughs> but let's talk about her dreams instead. It's my father. He died before I was born. But I dream of death and trying to save him. Anyway, that's my shit. About that guy who exploded by chains. I said it came out of this. Given the camera angle, nothing good is going to come out of that box. It is definitely going to be spring snakes. Opening that box seems as good of an idea as sticking your hand inside of this thing. <laughs> Radhead is when the Cenobites started getting really lazy. Never mind opening the box, just spill some blood on the statue. That'll bring Pinhead back to life. The girls bond over breakfast and the days when Terry used to be a reporter. She retired, though, after mistakenly outing Jerry and George. Now stop eyeing my backdrop and tell me about the dead guy. Well, there's a store. It's, like, really hip. You know, lots of weird shit in there. And I don't know, I saw the statue. Mmm, Montgomery Wards! Got it on a Columbus Day sale, didn't you? They find the art gallery, but discover that it mainly just deals in paintings of Jesse Eisenberg. Oh, and the place is a scam. Weird. JP seems on the up and up. Check it out. It's the box. Ooh, the storyboards. I have the feeling JP might be a little sleazy. Welcome. You're J.P. Monroe, right? That's right. And this is your club? His club has the best Manhattans and the best ADRing in the city. Joey has an amazing lead after gathering a couple of headshots of actors from the previous films. Things aren't going too well, though, for J.P. and his date. But you gave me a rose. And tomorrow, I'll give one to somebody else. I smell a third act breakup. <laughs> They'll get back together. Pinhead will kill anything that moves in this one. He's officially a slasher villain now, especially because this is the first of the Hellraiser movies to call him Pinhead in the actual movie, and not Jesus. Jesus Christ! Not quite. Still gonna have to work on that voice, though. When shooting him surprisingly doesn't work, he has to bring Pinhead more club goers so that he can feed on them and turn into Frank. Wait a minute, I might be mixing the plot lines here. And cut out that racket! I heard some shots. Are you okay? 
wait, that was in the club? Again, best soundproofing I've ever heard. Joey is given exclusive cameo footage. I wonder if it'll be Ashley Lawrence, who they mistakenly refer to as Kirsty, when her name is Curtsy. I opened it, and I saw what came out. I don't know what else to call them. <laughs> Never mind. What in the hell is Nancy Thompson doing in this? And you can't just leave the box sitting on top of the VCR. It'll get folded and all scratched up. What do you think happened to my copy of Bolero? Thanks, Pinhead! And now she'll be turned into Lolita Head. Or much worse, she'll get a phone call from an ex. This is kind of like the brain that wouldn't die if the head was in a statue and had pins in it. Unfortunately, they're cock-blocked by more random war flashbacks. <laughs> Y'all just don't understand Terrence Malick's Vietnam. No, oh, I've communicated to you from beyond the grave to tell you that that was World War I. Well, that was a weird cutaway. Now let me feed you to a statue. Wait! Just because the demon said wait doesn't mean you have to. Though he does give her a nice offer, a free McRib and a supersized order of heroin if she offers up JP. <laughs> no, he was so nice! Oh, thank God I can move my neck now, but I'd still rather not. <laughs> Hello, I am Brad Jones talking to you over the sound of my PC motor to tell you that today's video is sponsored by writer-director Dustin Mills and his latest film, Slaughterhouse Slumber Party. Let's take a look at a clip. better have a slumber party in it. Anyway, Joey tries to sleep despite the painting of a demon boy on the wall. It's also a little hard with Grandpa's old radio in the closet scoring the soundtrack to L.A. Confidential, among other things. Go to the window, Joey. Don't go to the window. She goes to the window. Now what? How the hell do I know? But you better think of something. There's still several sequels. She sees Doug Bradley completely out of his Jason makeup, where we see even more flashbacks. Joey, how kind of you to come. You slaughtered your whole platoon, didn't you? See, this is what happens when your war isn't miraculously ended by Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. This is pre-Pinhead Elliot Spencer, who still has Pinhead-esque dialogue. What the hell is going on? Hell is exactly what is going on, Joey. Guess she kind of set him up for that one. And I already know how Pinhead was created from the other movies. I know way more information than the lead character does. Although that's how he became an art exhibit. It was the blob that caused it. Elliot wants to face off against his evil self in order to destroy, uh, himself once and for all. There is a gateway to hell through which he can be taken back. Where is it? Your apartment. That's why rent is so cheap. Let's not forget, we still got a soundtrack to sell. A little hard to play here with all this damn noise. Apparently, this place does not have an age restriction. Someone better shut this place down. <laughs> Oops, I hope the baby's okay. Pinhead's really not dressed out of place here. Although this scene is like the series equivalent of Freddy murdering teens at a pool party. I know I shouldn't ask this in a slasher film, but what did any of these people do? See, that's what's gonna happen to you if you don't buy the soundtrack. 
Oh God, this is a tragedy. There's got to be one band member still alive to give me an autograph? Well, I guess the reporters and the police weren't really there. Or they just left to give the dead bodies a couple more extra hours of shut-eye. It was you who did this, wasn't it? There is a secret song at the center of the world, and its sound is like razors through flesh. <laughs> it's She Thinks My Tractor's Sexy, isn't it? Now kill him with insults! You're gonna have to come and get me, you ugly fuck! Just because he doesn't feel the pins does not mean that he doesn't feel your words! I sense a climax coming on. <laughs> Look, we gotta spend the budget somehow. I knew all these explosions were just here to screw with Larry. And thus we have the best Cenobite of all time, Camera Head. His curse is that he can only see an SD. Ready for your close-up, Joey? Though Pinhead will have to kill him for his one-liners not being as good. CD Head, on the other hand, is cursed with always scratching his discs, so I can't listen to any of my Deep Blue Something albums. And then there's Lush Head. The gang is all here. <laughs> Too bad they're all dicks. Dicks with bad puns. That's a wrap. Your life has been put on pause. Press here to eject your soul! I need help, Father, and for the last time, I'm not Kimberly Williams! Demons, demons aren't real? Then what the fuck is that? You're still in a church, little missy! And it's nice of Pinhead to give the guest sermon. I am the way. He's quite the eyesore, but his message from Jesus is still very much on target. Oh right, JP and Terry. Now they're anti-smoking ad head, and I forgot JP was in this head. Oh no, the box isn't supposed to turn against us! <laughs> Shot on shitty o head has been taped over. Guess that's the end. <laughs> There's still 13 minutes left. Best go back to the past again. The fields are peaceful and quiet when there isn't a war. And no, 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 that's not your dad. That is definitely Pennywise. Don't listen to him. See? Now he has the box. Couldn't resist playing games, could you? You had to come through the window of her mind. Just like Gemini Man. It was a mistake to make Pinhead Jigsaw's new apprentice. He really strayed away from John's original thesis. However, they must be destroyed before the effects go way over budget. Too late. Pinhead's dead and you're a hundred K in the hole. Now let's bury the thing in the cement in this construction site so that no one will be cursed with the singing frog ever again. Though it will make the architect suddenly want to turn everything into the box for some reason. Find out why in the sequel. Or not. It probably won't mention it. And yes, four years later we got another sequel. And you best believe it's the one that goes into outer space. I bet that means it's the best one. It's going to be so good that the director is going to use the Alan Smithy credit for fear of it being too perfect. Unlike this measly, mediocre score where we're told, try to defend it, I dare you. Um, the effects are good. Challenge accepted. We're still in the midst of the Halloween season, but I don't know what movie to do next. Luckily, I have got the tax box here to help us out with a Patreon poll for the next episode. Let's see what our choices are. We have got Scanners. Ooh, I'll bet that doesn't have any sequels. And The Exorcist. I swear I already saw the superior version. Our third choice is... Scream. Oh, hey, welcome back to the poll. 
And of course, the sacrificial melodrama, Dreamer. It's probably about love and bowling. Subscribe to patreon.com slash the cinema snob to vote on the next episode. And put as much care into your vote as I did the tox box. It took me minutes to rip apart these pieces of paper and write titles on them. <laughs> Have my real glasses been on this whole time? Happy 37th birthday to one of the most perfect films ever made, The Toxic Avenger. Show some toxy love by joining the only streaming service you'll ever need, Troma Now. There's new titles every month, world premieres, traumatic extras, and all the trauma classics you love, like The Toxic Avenger, Sergeant Kabuki Man, Class of Nukem High, and more. Plus, some other movies you may have heard of, too. Start your free trial today at watch.troma.com. Well, if you have a leprechaun going into space, that's just a slippery slope to Pinhead going to space. At least in the order that I watch these movies. The 1996 film Hellraiser 4 Bloodline was such a troubled shoot, to put it lightly, that Pinhead star Doug Bradley even called it the shoot from hell. Well, it is Hellraiser, so maybe that's a compliment. Maybe that means this is the greatest Hellraiser movie ever made! The movie began life as one of the most ambitious Hellraiser scripts written. The film became the last Hellraiser movie that Clive Barker had any official involvement in, and he wanted a fresh take for the series. The movie was originally written as a linear story that spanned three timelines and included a lot more characters and special effects, and with themes of sex, death, slavery, and bondage. A lot of that is still in the movie, just if you hit the mix button. Guillermo del Toro and Stuart Gordon were both offered a chance to direct, but declined, and directing duties went to... Oh, great! They hired the director of Ghost Fever? Well, this isn't gonna turn out well. Actually, the director of the film was Kevin Yeager, who had previously directed a couple of Tales from the Crypt episodes. You know, I'm sure there's a story behind using the Alan Smithy pseudonym on the movie, but <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Given the non-linear structure of the film, it's a whole movie of, eh, we'll talk about that later. As for the opening, it's like if the term budget cuts were an opening credit. Sweet, we'll use the theme from the non-existent Nintendo 64 tie-in. But as for the special effects, <laughs> oh, that's uh, not that bad, actually. It looks a little iffy when something moves, but it could be better, could be worse. We open on Space Station Minos in 2127. This movie had better not get complicated. It's one of those ships completely made up of basements, and your emo son's barricaded bedroom. I'm starting to see what the studio notes were. Hmm, yeah, pretty good, but needs a T-800. This is engineer Paul Merchant, played by Bruce Ramsey. He's created this robot for the sole purpose of completing the Laurent configuration. <laughs> or you could just use a YouTube instructional video. However, space troops are trying to stop him because no one on this ship is going to be a dirty cheat. I have the feeling that this part of the story was supposed to come in later, considering how originally Pinhead didn't appear until 40 minutes into the film. But God forbid you have patience in a movie about a puzzle box. I guess we're still in the future. I don't know. Do we still have 1996 hair in the 22nd century? The rest is told in flashback, as Merchant delicately tells all of this to Rimmer. I'm playing the end game here, Rimmer. Finishing something that began centuries ago, and I don't have the time to help you understand. So he built a spaceship so people would be stuck hearing his intergalactic acting talent? Oh no, he's gonna tell me his family backstory, isn't he? Centuries ago, a man, an ancestor of mine, 
built a puzzle box. Now he's Philip Lamarchand, an ambitious toy maker. If only he had waited a couple hundred years, he could have had machines building the box for him. Ah! Is it done? Done. Hey, uh, excellent. That nice Geppetto fella next door made a real boy. Perhaps you should step it up a notch. Thankfully, he has a supportive wife. Oh. Doesn't actually do anything. Yes, but watch what happens when I put my dick in it. He made the box for Libertine Duke de Lisle with special instructions to make it a portal to hell. That must have been the cinnamon that he added. What kind of weirdo would ask for this? All alone in this dark, dark world. Oh great, he's also Dracula. He's rich though, so he has his assistant, Jacques, bring him fresh girls for dinner. <laughs> Monsieur de Lille is France's greatest magician. Holy shit, it's Rob Lowe! Eh, so some old rich weirdo is tying me up to a chair. I see this going well. <laughs> so that's why Ben Wyatt was voted out as mayor. Maybe this isn't the 18th century. Maybe it's just Halloween. Le Marchand. As precise as your pieces, as timely as your toys. Stop answering the door like this. We never get visitors anymore, and I miss my Girl Scout cookies. He's got the right tools needed just in case the box is really hard and you have to pry open that sucker yourself. You see, folks, back then you couldn't just have a Frank show up all skinless. You had to create your own skinless Frank. We worked hard for our escapees from hell. Plus, it made it easier if you knew the magic words. Spectare navicula suavis. Stop trying to impress me with words you just looked up in a book that you've never read. God, people were bored before movie theaters were invented. This is why we need a Hellraiser movie set during the pandemic era. With theaters closed, think of how many portals to hell were created. Good lord, what kind of deformed monster will this box create? A summoned demon is yours to command. Damn, bro, he's gonna bang that Cenobite. Or is he? We'll find out after this. Time to play. Enter the maze and run for your eternal life. Hellbound Hellraiser 2, tonight at 9. On my mind, be afraid. As we continue on with Hellraiser, E.T. the porno style, Le Marchand immediately knows he designed a box that will bring forth demons. So he's hard at work on a box that'll have the opposite effect. Just like when the creator of the Jigsaw Puzzle created posters. It's already put together, that saves so much time. But it's when he goes to steal the box that, uh, <laughs> you know, on second thought, I don't need to fix the hell box. It's the 18th century. We're all gonna die at age 30 anyway. With Adam Scott being in the film, I feel like I'm watching an episode of Drunk History, and this is the riveting story about how Alexander Cummings invented a flush toilet. Okay, so what's going on again? Shock was right. Demons did walk the earth. Thanks for that important insight. This was back when Miramax was re-editing horror films so that a five-year-old wouldn't get confused. And in doing so, they made an even more confusing mess! <laughs> ah! Look at me, look at me. <laughs> Meanwhile, in 1996... Now he's John Merchant, married to Bobby, and, uh, wait, Kim Myers? All of these years I've been so focused on the Grady Cinematic Universe, I've forgotten to spotlight movies from the Lisa universe. I take it his bloodline has been cursed, and Angelique is there to make sure all of his relatives get prank phone calls. She brings Adam Scott with her too, because, well, every generation needs laughter. They do a good job of fitting into the time periods. Oh man, he's gonna lecture the fuck out of her about some Morrissey. 
It's a Hellraiser movie with Adam Scott as a villain. It can't be all bad, even if he is dumb enough not to realize that if you piss off and threaten a demon, she may scratch your face and eat your flesh. You'd think he'd know this after 200 years. Oh, he's dead, by the way. Thank you. The one thing that was carrying me through this is now gone. How dare you not know he was going to get famous later? I don't care if you did give me a free trip to New York out of it. So John Merchant has built a skyscraper designed like the Laurent configuration. <laughs> Guess they didn't learn their lesson when they let Evo Shandor design shit. But let's throw in a death scene. How is this being described in the future scenes? And then Angelique met a horny bastard in the lobby. She talked him into going into a cold basement with her. In 1996, we would all risk getting murdered if it meant getting laid. I was going to put this part of the story in later, but the ship's captain wanted me to speed it up and get to the canine hell beast segment sooner. And now here's what you paid money to see. <laughs> We will fix that voice in post, for you see in 1996, every Dimension film was fixed in post. I think even Pinhead is confused by some of these plot points. The box did this? What the hell, 1996? Tell me this was done ironically! Pinhead and Angelique have very large differences in their theories on pain and seduction, but they put their differences aside to stop Merchant before he can complete the Elysium configuration, which would end the Laurent configuration. <laughs> it's best we get in a good nap, though. Too much Hellraiser bloodline can give you a headache. Then we can get back to Pinhead. I grow impatient with the princess. Where'd he get that bird? And then, dear Rimmer, two security guards found a weird-looking door and decided to investigate it because upon looking through, it seemed legit and like something you'd want to walk through. It's funny to think that this movie was sort of controversial. This is around the time Disney bought out Miramax. So, I don't know, some screeching parents thought a Hellraiser movie would have the Disney logo in front of it? With all this sexual tension, though, I'm surprised this was theatrical. I figured it'd be the first one to debut on Cinemax. As I was saying, these two idiots are continuing to investigate without calling for backup. And they make the worst mistake, offending Pinhead. Make us put some pain on you. Pain? How dare you use that word? That word is Pinhead's word! Hence why he introduces himself as Major Pain. Who didn't see this part of the story coming? Look away, children! This is a Disney story. For you see, Rimmer, my story has very cool special effects. But just when you think it's over, <laughs> why would you think that? Not even I know what's going on in this film! They say the greatest suffering a parent can know is the loss of a child. Oh shit, they're gonna kill his subscription to Architect Magazine! Also, throw a red sock in with the laundry. We will bring them hell on Earth. You can feel it that so much was changed in post. From script to final cut, so many characters were rewritten, with motivations changing, and some consolidated into other characters, that you have a movie which spans across three time periods, and yet these characters barely feel like they're here. It's easy to see why Barker even considered making it a three-part film. At least then, the characters would have felt real. Here, they're just walking plot devices, and not particularly bright. Huh, I don't remember the hallways leading to the laundry room being this creepy. Huh, <laughs> whatever, the laundry's not gonna do itself. It, hey, how'd this red sock get in here? Soon enough, tragedy strikes. Is Jack's toy Ferris wheel okay? <laughs> I recognize that child's play stinger. He's gonna blame Chucky! Or maybe his questionable babysitter. 
Oh, what appetites. I could teach him. Well, that's just a typical Hollywood agent at the time. They were always saying creepy shit like this. Oh, I want bait. Live bait. Okay, excuse me, you're getting your Shining remake mixed up with my Elm Street 2, which also has elements of the Dream Child and New Nightmare, which is all for some reason in a Hellraiser movie. Anyway, on with running to save the family, as if it isn't obvious there are several scenes missing between this one and this one. And Kim Myers will be fine. She's used to this by now. She's been trapped by hell dogs in a slasher movie before. Oh, but then, dear Rimmer, I needed a fresh pair of underpants, so I walked through the hallway leading to our laundry room. It was much cleaner than usual. Unfortunately, the neighbor dog had gotten into the house. John, don't! Oh, psych! Take that to the bank, B! He's gonna bring it up at the next tenants meeting that no one warned him about the sexual predator Cenobite living in the building. When you love this boy, you have plans for him. Actually, I hate my son. He is not my Danny Torrance. Merchant has a master plan to escape Pinhead, and that plan is bolt, 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 bolt! Which is what Kevin Yeager did when Miramax demanded so many reshoots. They also demanded more Pinhead and a happy ending, all of which led Yeager to step away, having been burnt out by the already tiring shoot. Director Joe Chappelle was brought in to finish the movie, himself the survivor of directing a nightmare shoot. Which is kind of ironic, these two movies are editing nightmares butchered by reshoots, but they did predict 2000's comedy stars. These Hellraiser bloodline edits are very obvious, but I hope that every cut of the film still contained this line. Daddy! <laughs> I didn't even add that! Plus, you gotta keep it in, where Bobby's stuck in a building with Shockma the Killer Baboon. It is still a Hellraiser movie, so there's great makeup effects put into it by Gary Tunnicliffe, who also did work on Hellraiser 3, and would later direct Hellraiser Judgment. And I've got Lloyd on hand with his own explosions ready. And now it's time for What If It Exploded, hosted by Lloyd. There's a fortune in abortion. The gold mine in the sex line. And this has been What If It Exploded, hosted by me, Lloyd. Okay, to catch you up, here this is Jack, but over here he was Danny and not Jack. While there are creepy elevators, none of them are filled with blood. So now Angelique wants Merchant to start the Elysium configuration to destroy Pinhead because it's a motivation change on a dime universe. Speaking of things happening quickly... <laughs> More horror villains need to realize, you know, I could just kill the hero now. Oh, it's not over yet. He's gonna send her to hell to make her pay for what she did to Adam Scott. There was supposed to be a bigger battle between Pinhead and Angelique, but here, eh, the box explodes and it pisses off Pinhead. Then we're back in outer space, <laughs> naturally. You carried the bloodline, the guilt for what our family had begun. Yes, but why did you tell me about those security guards? That was really gross. Oh, the flashbacks aren't over. Now we get a future flashback in the future scenes. Yes, he built this ship as a way to trap Pinhead in space and destroy him, but really, this just ruins all of the Hellraiser movies after it. Now I know Pinhead will survive in those, since here he is in the year 2127, because I'm sure the later movies give a shit. Jesus, Dr. Merchant, this seems like a really dire situation. Why did you waste time telling me this really long story, which you told very slowly and with multiple tangents. Plus, they are in a spaceship during a horror climax, which means there's going to be a countdown that will definitely lead to an explosion. The rest of the movie is like a prototype for Jason X, as Pinhead just begins bumping off crew members. And look, he even brought the two security guards with him! See, aren't you glad I told you that part of my story? Angelique must have a very specific contract. You can turn me into a Cenobite, but I still have to be hot. 
Honestly, I don't know what jokes to say during some of these segments. Again, I feel like I just reviewed this movie mere weeks ago. I guess I could give some advice. If you see someone trapped in a mirror, don't help them. They're not your friend. Part of the mission is successful, at least. The ship contains the first hell dog to orbit the Earth. And you can do puzzle boxes in space, maybe. <laughs> Perhaps the uncut version is just 30 minutes of him trying to figure out that box. While some of the effects are great, others are a little questionable. This is why Camera Head's not in the movie. He only films in camera torment. Anyway, the ship's about to explode. <laughs> Take your time. The creatures that walk on its surface, always looking to the light. Uh, yeah, how long is this countdown? Just saying, we're on a bit of a time crunch here. So many things are making sense now. If we use the same hell dog over and over again, that saves us money on creating new Cenobites, which would require different makeup effects for each person. Just don't destroy the dog, he's our only one. <laughs> Who built that room? After living for a couple of centuries, I'm starting to think Pinhead is getting a bit of a god complex. I. Am. Forever. Sadly though, he's not immune to recasting. I should have seen this coming. He tricks Pinhead with a hologram, and he didn't even need to use sexy camp counselors to do so. The Elysium configuration works, but think of all the money that could have been saved from building this ship when all you had to do was keep the box closed. And the one-liners are getting a little hard to hear. He's fine. They just teleported him direct to video. And prepare for an ending that's just as abrupt as every scene in the movie. <laughs> yes, a movie with so much heart that they jumped at the first chance they could get to cut to the ending credits. I'm rather surprised a wild re-edit of the movie was never released. You can see the ambition, but you can also feel the studio notes and re-edits. Plus, every frame of the film instantly screams, <laughs> Yep, Dimension Horror Film from 1996. I hereby demand the release of the Jaeger cut. Which, of course, would have included Jaegers. Same thing if Stuart Gordon directed and brought in the robot jocks. The film wasn't a financial success, but it's still a franchise, which means more movies came out, just not in theaters, as this was the last one to be released theatrically. I'm sure we'll get to those soon enough. I'll just have to script a review for something else and then insert myself talking about Pinhead in them. It would be very appropriate for those movies. He's got pins in his head. We're long past the era of theatrical Hellraiser movies. Now on with the era of direct-to-video Hellraiser movies that did not start out as Hellraiser movies. <laughs> you know what that means. <laughs> Inferno. Inferno. Oh my god. That's right. Inferno. Many ideas were pitched after the box office disappointment of Hellraiser Bloodline, one of which would have been called Hellraiser Hellfire, which would have had Kirsty battling a cult that wants to unleash Cenobites into the world. This was rejected due to budget concerns since the movie was going direct to video. Even Clive Barker was dropped due to creative differences, and the two proposed follow-ups to Bloodline were dropped early on too. Don't they know the rules? Once you go into space, clearly Pinhead has to go to the hood or fight Freddy Krueger. So what we got was Hellraiser Inferno, the story of a corrupt cop who finds the box at a crime scene and searches for a mysterious killer known as the Engineer. 
The film was written by Paul Harris Borsman and Scott Derrickson, with Derrickson directing, and you may know him as the director of The Exorcism of Emily Rose, Sinister, Deliver Us From Evil, and of course, Doctor Strange. Boo on Marvel for not writing in big words from the director of Hellraiser Inferno. That would have put me there in seconds. If you think about it, Pinhead and Doctor Strange are practically the same character. One shows you such sights as chains ripping the flesh off your bones, and the other fills your house with portable holes. The script for Inferno wasn't even originally intended to be a Hellraiser movie, but was rewritten to be a Hellraiser 5, just like the time Bad Lieutenant was rewritten to be a sequel to Leviathan. Of course, it was put out by Miramax, so it was still nominated for 12 Oscars that year. While the opening titles look a little more like the intro on the website that's promoting the movie, it has very smooth, relaxing music playing, until the threatening music kicks in at ironically the right moment. Oh, you opened the wrong box! Pinhead is way more trustworthy! Craig Sheffer plays Detective Joseph Thorne. He's a detective so hard-ass that it's a good thing we don't see him beating the shit out of these kids whenever they knock over his chess table. Guys, you can't just hit the button. You have to actually play. And remember, folks, the more crooked the cop, the more there's a chance he'll provide narration. Even as a little kid, I was always one to examine things closely. I also always wanted to be a gangster, but that was also rewritten as another movie. And with Nicholas Turturro there, who knew it counts as a Hellraiser sequel and an NYPD Blue crossover? Here at the crime scene, things went really bad at the orgy. There they were with their masks on, when he suddenly exploded due to having his ass packed with firecrackers instead of cucumbers. There's clues all over the place here. Gentlemen, the first thing we need to do is question this so-called Ishmael. This is like a pilot for a show called Drug Cop. He solves crimes with the help of drugs being hidden at the crime scenes. And that's not the most disturbing thing there. It's the child's finger and the edits. It's a child's finger. What was the editor's note there? Okay, I know there isn't a zoom there, but can you add one? I'm also really on drugs. He finds the puzzle box at the crime scene, which I wonder what it was in the original script. Was it a Rubik's Cube? No matter, time to end a long, hard day of work with a long, hard night of sex. This is like a Cinemax movie that is honestly just kind of tired and wants to go to bed. But I think that voice in his head is making him sneak outside. I believe in loyalty. Fidelity. And in miracles. Where are you from, you sexy thing? Thorne has everything on the crooked cop checklist. Drug addiction, spends his nights banging hookers. Also, if they could dress like an 80s hooker movie like Vice Squad, that would make it even better. But really, he just gets hookers to impress them with his amazing sleight of hand tricks. Now to play Where's My Dick? Great, the movie's jerking off so hard it just broke a blood vessel. Oh yeah, he also drinks too. He's really lacking in the cigarette department though. We should have seen him smoke a whole pack by now. Maybe that's what he's gonna open the box for. You know, on second thought, maybe it wasn't a good idea for me to hold on to this piece of evidence. Why do I even have this? They had to lower the budget in a lot of areas. In this movie, when you open the box, you're given another cozy room to lie down in. It's a very sleepy movie, largely due to the drugs and alcohol. That's not even part of the movie. The film just gives you a contact high while you're watching it. I think this is very quickly turning into the Hellraiser porn parody. I should have known from the poster. Not only is it called Inferno, but it looks like Pinhead is stepping into a steam room where he's ready to shred that ass like lettuce and cover it with hot man dressing. Sorry, what's going on in this house? Oh, 
I get it. It's also written as an Elm Street movie, just in case. But luckily, Pinhead came to the set that day. Welp, I'm giving up the drugs. Alright, so the dead body was torn apart by hooks, but that's obvious shit. We need some witty cop banter interrupted by weird shit. Detective Thorne. And the girl you were with last night. You didn't tip the hooker, did you? Once again, his partner should hang back. He's gonna Josh Brolin the hell out of this case on his own. On second thought, he needs someone to be a dick to. That way, he can send in his partner to find in whatever horrible imagery is in the shower. What the fuck? What the fuck do you mean you stayed there last night? Jesus Christ! The pipes, they're all rusty. There was a roach in the tub, pubic hair on the toilet. Jesus, Joe! No time for dead hookers. Gotta clean Joe's fingerprints off the crime scene. That way we can blame the whole thing on Barabbas. Also, this doesn't count as him smoking. We can't show him smoking, but we can show a dead hooker. Well, that is what he paid for. Honestly, this is a pretty good detective story that just happens to have Pinhead in it. I'm kind of into where this case is leading. Once it leads to a tattoo and body piercing parlor, it's like a better sequel to 8mm than that movie they tried passing off as a sequel to 8mm. Weirdly, Tattoo Frankenstein isn't the killer. He just simply gave the murder victim the box from a killer known as the Engineer. As you do! Unfortunately, this is where the drugs really start kicking in. So are you gonna frisk me or fuck me? And it's starting to feel way more like the box cover. Drugs kicking in, though, is just an excuse to get more drugs. And to find out about the engineer, if there's time. But if you don't, have a dream sickle. I'm gonna have to cut there, because like every ice cream truck, it's covered with pictures of naked women. But when we come back, I can show you the demon cowboys, I promise. The entire population of Twin Peaks wants you to stay tuned. Ugh, between the flashbacks showing a severed head in a man's bed, Detective Thorne does not need a bigger headache today. I want to tell the captain about Daphne. I want to tell him what we did. Hmm, I thought all the narcs worked in a different department. So you know all that stuff he planted at the crime scene? That was his partner's. That way he could use it as blackmail so his partner doesn't rat him out. You fucking scumbag. And he's taking it fairly well considering. But I'm 10 steps ahead of these cops. If you get a videotape during a movie like this, there's a 100% chance it's going to be a snuff film. Huh, <laughs> sure, put it on in public for the whole bar to see. Huh, okay, I wasn't expecting that tie-in either. I see the tape could possibly reveal the identity of the killer. Unfortunately, it doesn't narrow it down, because I swear I've seen this demon in every demon possession film of the last 20 years. But one thing we do need to bring back, crooked cops in movies who say normal sentences with brooding intensity. What are you gonna do? I'm gonna go lie down and talk about my childhood. Dude would sound scary while simply ordering fries and a milkshake from McDonald's. How dark and twisted is this universe? The psychiatrist he's sent to is James Remar? <laughs> well, okay. I think we found out who one of the villains is. <laughs> Close-up magic. I bet your daughter loves that. He's Pinhead. Not that everyone else in the movie isn't also creepy. Children are the only sacred thing left in this world. And most of these little ones were gone for good. I keep their souls in my balls. Luckily, they're hauling in anyone to the station who looks like this. We found him on set of the unholy. Hey, you self detective. What's a freaking problem? You're gonna have to curse harder than that if you want to remain in this precinct, officer. They are on the case to find more editing notes. Look, just put in some post effects to make it shake. They're driving really fast, so it has to shake all over the place. If he's looking for demons, he knows where to go. The saloon from Carmen's Satan Bite the Dust. Party's over. Shut it down. I'm hunting for someone, y'all. 
Color me intrigued. Is this a western now? Who is this strange cowboy who knows the engineer? You like to play games, don't you, detective? The engineer likes games. I feel like I'm watching Mulholland Drive if the pilot version was picked up by the USA Network. I have no idea where this is going, but it has a possible Cenobite dressed as a cowboy. How can I get mad at this movie? It's not the creepy hell spawns that are making this run through the woods weird. It's that it's supposed to be 2 a.m., but clearly looks like 2 in the afternoon, amongst other baffling imagery. Because I represent a whole new breed of Christian out today. What is happening? Cowboy demons in a karate fight with crooked cop Craig Sheffer. I'm of the opinion all of the remaining Hellraiser movies should have been based on Scott Derrickson's scripts. Still gonna find that child. That, I suspect, is the object of the game. Look, if you hire an actor from Lost Highway, it'll definitely keep turning into a David Lynch film. Although I think this one might be called Motion Sickness Highway. Turn it off. Turn it off! They often quote lines from hardcore when they're on a long drive. He's going to the right place. <laughs> Look, Doc, can you just admit your pinhead so we can get this over with? I mean, you clearly know about the engineer. When I was first on the force, I heard about somebody called the engineer. Oh shit, he's on to me. Plus, James Remar has a file on all of his villainous roles from the past, from 48 hours to the Dream Team. And he offers foreshadowing for free, like the story of a cop who shot himself when investigating the engineer and left behind the box. I think I know where this is going. And if I don't, the narration will help. I live in a world of facts. And the fact is, this coffee needs more sugar. Oh, right. He forgot he has a wife and child. Sorry I'm late, honey. Now time for his nightly routine of drinking a whole bottle of Robitussin. It's the only way to see Pinhead for sure. Wait, no, you got the generic store brand. And seriously, no phone calls. That was your mother. She, she said that she had a visitor. I, I think that she said he was some kind of engineer. Oh god, Nikola Tesla has found us again. Now he's got to deal with the parents. He severely regrets putting them in the cheapest hospice he could find. It's very hard for the doctors to do their jobs, with the hallways turning into music videos. And when this happens... What a fine looking boy. Just another day at the Overlook Hospital. He came to save his parents, but what he found was another guilt trip. You guys okay? Why don't you visit us, Joe? It gets a little worse every day. Because this place is a stone-cold bummer! And it's a little too close to his family home. The parents living in the next room is going to be very hard on the marriage, especially with killers present. <laughs> Well, you don't have to pay those nursing home bills anymore. Also, the Puppet Master may be controlling this, because now we've rewound the events back ten minutes. I, I think that she said he was some kind of an engineer. Oh god, in reality, it's Thomas Edison. This time, though, his parents are missing. Excellent. The place is still a bummer, but at least he doesn't have to hear the guilt trip again. Also, his dad may have been turned into a bed. His parents are always leaving behind weird things they find at antiques malls, like fingers and a strange address. Needless to say, people are now starting to think that Joseph himself is the engineer. <laughs> Largely because of his rudeness. By the way, 416 Hawthorne Lane. <laughs> Sounds like it could have been a possible title for the original script. But as he sneaks into Elizabeth Ashley's apartment from Windows, on the bright side, Tony knows that Joe's not the killer now. With people around him dying, obviously the family is going to be next. But honestly, in Hellraiser terms, they got off fairly easily. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. James Remar is in on this? And are the bodies going to keep talking? It's really awkward. <laughs> Sorry. It gets weirder when the child's fingers left behind at the crime scenes are Joe's own fingerprints. 
This movie is an interesting take. It's like if Hellraiser was a procedural where Pinhead solves mysteries. Speaking of procedurals... And now it's time for Lloyd's Out of Context 911 Lone Star Clip of the Week. You know how you keep asking me not to leave incense burning in my room? Oh no. And that was the opening scene! Now that we're back, you don't need me to tell you who the psychiatrist is. I knew it. He's a script rewrite. But what's his role in this story? Who I am is no concern of yours. I mean, it kinda is. On with this fever dream through his past, his childhood home isn't so bad. He has nice farm artwork outside his window. Also, is this where we find out he grew up to be the killer from pieces? This is what we all did in the past. Watched nothing but Vietnam stock footage and read about Nixon. One more script to rewrite, you could have turned this into the Hellraiser Christmas Carol. It's a typical childhood. Eating brownies, and then a massive earthquake happens. Then the guilt trip again. We never see you anymore. Again, Mom, you're weird. This movie is a long way to go to tell him he never should have stayed in room 1408. I like how people keep returning to essentially call him a dickhead. I trusted you. Maybe it's time you two weren't partners anymore. This is a lot of people screwing with him, which always ends with him blasting them with a shotgun. <laughs> That's peculiar. Normally, this isn't the kind of door you'd want to go into, but eh, it's not like it's gonna be any more disturbing no matter where he goes. I'm still holding out hope that this is all being controlled by the bright burn version of Doctor Strange. Not only does he see himself as a kid with missing fingers, but he sees himself as... thought that's where this was going. <laughs> I still have no idea what's going on. And using chess analogies isn't gonna help me. I don't know how to play chess. From what I gather here, the engineer is the monster Joseph grew up to be and is murdering his own innocence. In other words... Welcome to hell. Eh, as long as there's still drugs and hookers. Or is he in hell? He is severely going to change his life. From now on, he'll cut his drug use in half and only see two hookers a week. But when he gets a phone call from earlier in the film, he has to shoot himself like the psychiatrist predicted. So that way, he's cursed to live with his demons forever. No! Don't worry, there's still more Hellraiser movies after this. I mean, Joseph Thorne isn't in them, but still. So, this is the first direct-to-video Hellraiser movie? Well, I must say, I kinda liked it. You could tell the Hellraiser connections were added in later, but it still sorta works in the story. The movie is like this weird hybrid of Hellraiser, Jacob's Ladder, Bad Lieutenant, and a David Lynch movie. It does make a good double feature with Scott Derrickson's other movie, Deliver Us From Evil, which was also a cop movie crossed with a horror film. It almost feels like a pilot of an anthology series, which would have revolved around different tales of the puzzle box. That's pretty much what the next few movies are, as two years later we got Hellraiser Hellseeker, another entry in the Hellraiser slash Jacob's Ladder universe. I'll get to that soon enough, but next week I should watch something happier to liven up my mood, like, uh, Saw or something. Sir, sir, wait! That man had a gun! Ooh, we've been hell-bounded and hell-on-earthed, and now it's time to meet the Hellseeker! Probably called that because the name Hellblazer was already taken. Naturally, with 2000's Hellraiser Inferno finding some success in the direct-to-video department, and that the reviews for it weren't that bad, two years later we got the next installment, Hellraiser Hellseeker, with a box cover that looks like it's smeared over a bathroom wall where you would normally see Jesus. The film was the first of the series to be directed by Rick Boda, 
who had previously been cinematographer on movies like Demon Knight, Blood Fist 3, The Glimmer Man, and House on Haunted Hill. He would also go on to direct the next two in the series, Deader and Hell World. As for the plot of the movie, it's pretty much the same as Inferno, except this one adds a couple of extra touches. The film brings back Ashley Lawrence as Kirsty Cotton in her final appearance in the series, and our lead is the great Dean Winters, bar none, one of our coolest most underrated actors of the past 25 years. Yeah, I don't care what the reviews of this movie look like. It's got Dean Winters, it's got Pinhead, I am watching this movie. Look, it even opens with a quote. Again, this should be a clue that Freddy should also be in the film. They even break out the party music! Because this is the Hellraiser opening credits that makes me want to dance! And it reminds me, I really should set my computer to have the puzzle box screensaver. And it's nice to see a Hellraiser movie that starts out happy. <laughs> see? Tickle fight! Dean Winters plays Trevor, who is married to Kirsty. They played with fire with the tickle fight, but got too cocky and it's the kiss that causes a terrible car accident. Oh, Kirstie's been through much worse, like reviewers calling her Christy. Look at it like this. It's raining out, so even if you didn't land in the water, you'd still be soaking wet. Trevor makes it out fine. As for Kirsty, she'll be back later in the movie. Wouldn't it be something, though, if this was her only scene? <laughs> wow, that character could have been anyone. I don't know about this hospital, though. It's nice to see you again. He's in hell. Plus, Rachel Hayward also played a doctor in Extro 2. This could be in the Extro universe, which is something because I don't even know if the Extro sequels are in the Extro universe. He's wondering where his wife is, but don't worry about that. Let's calm you down with some nice heroin. As if the car accident wasn't bad enough, I don't know how sanitary this hospital is. Wake up, Trevor. For instance, I'm not sure if he should be that alert during this operation. I went through this same procedure to get baby Huey singing out of my head. You'll be fine. How are those headaches? Need more heroin, or at least some good bedside manner. Two cc's of a hand job should do the trick. This car accident all seems like a nice and quick hospital procedure. Where's Christine? Where's my wife? That's what I'd like to know. He was standing there waiting 15 minutes for that lead-in. Unfortunately, his wife is missing, right? She was missing in the last two movies, too. Oh, one more thing. Uh, sorry, I already did my Columbo reference in last week's Saw episode. Ugh, and now I have to take the bus. Could this day get any worse? Much like Inferno, this one's also filled with characters on their way to a David Lynch set. You know how I know he's in some kind of afterlife? Don't you just love this look? It's the one cats get just before you eat them. The talking dog, obviously. But it's good to be back at home with a box of tissues so he can masturbate to their photo together. <laughs> Wait, is he gonna do that? There is a flashback sex scene. But a missing wife and car accident is no reason to take the day off work. This is really a spin-off of Oz, where Ryan O'Reilly is stuck in mental jail with hilarious sex comedy co-workers. Get some numbers going, any numbers at all will do. Hills have eyes. No, it's not the Hills have eyes, it's Hellraiser. And we'll have more when we come back. Coming soon on video and DVD. Not really sure what Trevor's job is, but one of his assignments is clearly to follow the clues. I knew it. Kirsty runs a sweatshop! Once you pop one flashback, you just can't stop. That's as good a time as any to get some chips. Just what kind of place is this? From the sex-crazed co-workers to the sex-crazed boss. He's in Skinamax hell. 
No, I said Lays, not Laid! His boss Gwen is played by Sarah Lane Redman, who was originally cast in this movie as Kirsty when they weren't sure if Ashley Lawrence would return. But when Ashley did come back, they liked her so much that they cast her as Gwen. And she is really good in her brief screen time. If he seems paranoid, it's because with this being an unrelated script that was rewritten to make it a Hellraiser movie, you never know when Pinhead is gonna pop up. This world is weird. This is a big news story? Shit, I really should have taken a personal day. They even found Marion Crane in the trunk. Unfortunately, he's now a murder suspect because he could have driven off the bridge on purpose. It's a very paranoid precinct, too. Everyone's looking at him like, I know it was you, you son of a bitch. Nancy Grace told me so. Boy, does this day keep getting weirder. What's the matter, boy? Like how the dog isn't talking anymore. And he's being watched over by someone who appears to be the engineer from Inferno. And he's having some kind of allergic reaction. <laughs> what a day to find out that you're allergic to eels. This dude gets laid at his work and in his own building. Well, what do you think? I think I need 20 hours of sleep, so please let me be. He decides not to jerk off to the picture tonight, but to go straight into his home porno collection. You see, tonight I've got something planned for you. Something I've been planning for a long time. And that's the night they made a snuff film. This is all on him. You can't live in a building lit and shot like this and not expect some kind of supernatural mystery to happen. For instance, his boss may be a ghost who still wants to bang him, even when he's so not in the mood. You can say goodbye to that promotion. I think executive producer Harvey Weinstein may have written some of this dialogue. He is really gonna regret taping over his wedding video, with Gwen being killed by VHS ghosts. And if that wasn't bad enough, god damn it, I'm back at work again. He's so desperate for help, he takes this guy's advice about getting some acupuncture. And it leads him right to Catherine Trammell. This'll take his mind off of these flashbacks. This is a Hellraiser movie, right? Someone is here to remind us. This musical puzzle. That's not the box, it's a Christmas ornament. Ah, okay, there's Pinhead. Honestly, right time, right place. If you're looking to get acupuncture, Pinhead is exactly who you'd want to go to. Which do you find more exhilarating, Trevor? The pain or the pleasure? Excuse me, I'd rather not talk, it distracts me. Now another cop comes in to say Trevor definitely killed her for the money. Ha! That's where you're wrong. According to the trivia, Kirsty only made enough to get a new fridge. I don't know, this movie ain't so bad. God forbid we let one event go unrecorded. Why don't you come to bed? He records everything. I relate to this guy! Though I've surprisingly never lived in a porn building. Can I, um, borrow something? No, you cannot detach my dick. Really what he needs is some medication to help with these night terrors. Oh, and he should also not kill his neighbor. Good thing Pinhead is there to tell him, just blame it on Nick Turturro. See? And with that, the dead body is gone. Plus, the dead neighbor is not only alive, but doesn't even recognize him anymore. It was all in his head, and he's gonna become the Joker. He should probably turn himself in now, or not. There's still 45 minutes left. Done. You were talking about me, weren't you? Even the police station is getting weirder. Brett the co-worker is there, but it's usually always some little girl saying shh in these movies. Best ask the cop who is an absolute beast at origami. He probably knows what's up with this box. And possibly who this very familiar merchant is. Hmm, you're James Remar again, aren't you? One familiar thing I'm noticing in these direct-to-video Hellraiser movies is that they all have a lot of hallways. And a lot of inserting. Seriously, Kirsty seems more randomly inserted into this script than Pinhead. And since when does anyone in this office actually work? Let's make yourself at home. You screwed up my solitaire high score, didn't you? 
Oh, and they found the puzzle box, clearly gifted to the detective by his former partner, Detective Craig Sheffer. Plus, he strangely turns into his current partner. Eh, seems normal. There's so much weirdness around here. Dean Winters is playing Trevor, but the Brett actor's name is Trevor. What the hell is going on? Eh, this went so well the last time. Might as well get some acupuncture again. Brett wouldn't steer him wrong. Jesus, is this really hell? Everyone wants to bang this guy. This is Hellraiser crossed with an erotic thriller. <laughs> Seriously, it really is becoming basic instinct. <laughs> that is one of my favorite cuts in this entire series. Even the resident he's talking to seems to not really exist, or he's in a different hospital. It's probably for the best he didn't go back to this one. I'm sure this hospital is better. Okay, you caught me. Oh wait, hospital smoking section? Okay, it's the same hospital. Forget opening the box. If anything, he needs to stop getting on this bus. Nothing good happens on it. It triggers flashbacks of his wife confronting him about cheating, and it always drops him off at some horror movie location. See? Pinhead is even in the puddles. After six movies, Doug Bradley knows this character so well, he even came up with a lot of his lines on his own, giving him more things to say than what was originally scripted. And all of it pretty in character. Even I've seen enough Hellraiser movies at this point to know that a good aspirin will take care of this whole thing. And don't trust Brett the co-worker, that's obvious. Let me remind you about your plan. We'd kill Kirsty, make it look like a suicide, you'd get all our money and we'd split it 50-50. Okay, even if they did hatch a plan to steal Kirsty's Hellraiser inheritance, it's simple, we blame the acupuncturist. Or there's that. Plus, we may have to find someone else to pin these murders on. Hey, if it's gonna be a murder mystery, then I'm going to talk like a TV procedural. Speaking of the cops showing up... Trevor. Things are not looking good for Trevor. Seems like an easy enough predicament. You all probably saw me walk in. You know that person died before that. Why am I here? And why do you have my grandma's kitchen phone in the interrogation room? What kind of place is this? And is the precinct any better on 911 Lone Star? And now it's time for Lloyd's out of context 911 Lone Star clip of the week. You know what happens when you immerse it in water? And this has been Lloyd's Out of Context 911 Lone Star Clip of the Week. I think this police station is run by the same people who run the hospital. And if there is a killer roaming around, I'm blaming this guy. I don't trust his serial killer stare. Better call a lawyer first. In this precinct, they speed things up right to the death penalty. The images don't get any better. <laughs> huh? A lawyer? Lawyer? I need a damn lawyer! It doesn't look good when you're put in a holding cell that's in the sewer. Now we find out why the detective and his partner were never in the same scene together. And we're made up of just the right parts. I see we've reached that point in the early 2000s where we've fully transitioned into bad Hellraiser effects. Perhaps the answers will be in this suspicious morgue, a place where I think people are alive when they go in, but come out dead. That's what happens when you put Pinhead in charge of the morgue. He fits all the bodies into a box. Pinhead just seems annoyed by all of this. In time. Let me see my wife. I said in time. There's a whole 13 minutes of the movie left. Be patient, she'll be back. There's definitely a formula in this series now. Our lead gets chained up in the end, and Pinhead provides a lot of exposition. For instance, you're a really bad husband if you give Kirsty the box as a gift. And if you're that bad of a husband, she might offer you up as a sacrifice because she needs to give Pinhead five souls to be set free. This all seems slightly out of character, I guess? I don't know. She's got a lot of stress in her past. It might have finally gotten to her. There is a longer version of this scene where they do actually bring up people like Frank and Julia, which they probably should have left that in, because as it is, it does seem random that this is Kirsty Cotton. 
The biggest twist is that it wasn't a tickle fight at all. It was a squirt gun fight. Welcome to the worst nightmare of all. Direct to video slow mo editing. So it was her that shot Trevor, pinned the other murders on him, leaving him a tortured soul in hell. If you think that's a sad ending, it's really not. He gets used to inflicting pain on himself and lives out the rest of his time in hell as Mr. Mayhem. As for Kirsty, she's gonna have to get a new car. I'm sure she lives happily ever after, maybe. It's her last appearance in the series. My guess is she's off to give this to whoever the lead character in the next movie is. Again, eh, I didn't think this movie was that bad. If you liked Inferno, you might like this. They're pretty much the same movie. It's carried by Dean Winters being awesome as always. There's good pinhead lines in the film. The surreal imagery is entertaining. But yeah, even more so than the last one, this one feels like Hellraiser characters crowbarred into another script. Sure, this is Kirsty, but really, it could have been any character, and it wouldn't have made one bit of difference to the movie's story. Her cameo in part three felt more like a part of that movie's story than her inclusion in Hellseeker. But despite negative reviews, Clive Barker was said to have enjoyed the film, providing some influence and notes to the movie's third act, and called it the best since Hellbound. The movie was a strong enough hit on video that three years after came the next direct-to-video sequel, Deader, wasting an opportunity to call it Dead and Deader. Now that I've gotten the review written, allow me to go back and rewrite it by inserting E.T. and more porn into it. No reason, it just makes sense. Ooh, he has such sights to show us. You got a piece of ass, didn't you? The last two Hellraiser movies, Hellraiser Inferno and Hellraiser Hellseeker, really weren't that bad. I'm told this one is the turn. Could that be the case? Filmed in Romania in 2002, but released direct-to-video in 2005, Hellraiser Deader continues the pattern of being an unrelated script, then turned into a Hellraiser film. The movie began life as a spec script called Deader, which was written by Neil Marshall Stevens during the production of Thirteen Ghosts, which he also wrote. The script was about a reporter investigating a cult that supposedly finds the secret of immortality. Writer Tim Day, who also co-wrote Hellseeker, wanted the next Hellraiser film to be a direct follow-up to Hellseeker, which again would have had Kirsty facing off against Pinhead. But producer Bob Weinstein figured, eh, it'll just be easier to have Tim Day rewrite the Deader script. Oh, and movies like Ring and Pulse are also popular, so make it like that. Rick Boda, the director of Hellseeker, also returned to direct this film. There's very little trivia on the film, except, oh, so that's what Cenobite means. I don't know how I can process this next Hellraiser film without the power of demon cowboys or the power of Dean Winters, but I guess I'll try. I'm sure the movie will make sense. It says it's in association with logic. And it had better have a screen savory like opening credit sequence like the last couple of films. I think they may have cut the budget on the credits too. Although I wasn't really expecting the movie to open the same exact way as the Trump prophecy. Drug abuse is affecting everyone here, even the dog. There sure is an awful lot of drugs around here. I licked up this powder off the floor. And now my tail is like a big dragon that I can chase. Kari Wurr plays investigative reporter Amy Klein. Can't you tell? Subtle. You're blending right in. She must now quickly submit her story. Drugs are bad, okay? Actually, her real titles are even funnier. How to be a crack whore? Is it, is it actually teaching you how to be a crack whore? This is the third worst BuzzFeed article. Although she is very popular with her co-workers. You want me to show you what I learned? Right here, right now. Uh, wait, um, does my roll call for a sex scene? 
Still, these characters have nothing on the pretentious greatness of her boss, Charles. I detect that unique and ubiquitous combination of nicotine and patchouli oil that can only signal the arrival of the delightful and world famous. Mmm, I read your book about being a crack whore. I have lit my office like a drug house and have sold my children. He's got a much better story for her. A snuff film sent in by a cult called The Debtors. The tape is so powerful, even the movie itself begins being shot like the tape. She is the place we go to learn. Okay, settle down, camera work. We lost the sacred knife, so here's a gun. But some of us are a little too nervous about the whole murder thing. So if you could do it yourself, that'd be great. <gasps> I'm sure any reporter watching this tape would have questions. Did you call the police on this? Just watch. This is where it starts to get very sexy. I have jerked off to the tape five times to verify its authenticity. On the tape, Lestat is able to bring her back to life. Unfortunately, she now has to live with a giant hole in her head that will definitely get infected. Thankfully, though, it came with a return address to Bucharest. Oh, that's convenient. It's where all the Euro trash kids looking for a good time are heading these days. Amsterdam is so 90s. I bought all of my brides from Bucharest. I know what's hip with the kids, and they're sipping on chamomile, watching boys and girls and their sex appeal. Okay, so this is a simple sequence of her getting an assignment and leaving, but why is it edited so weird? Isn't it a little early for scenes to just hit the mix button? She tracks down the address, which they didn't even have to send a return. Just look for the hotel that's perfect not just for a horror film, but a direct-to-video Hellraiser film. And are her friends coming with her? Got any more of that delicious crack? My tail's a wagon. Okay, so there could be a dead body behind the door, or they just simply have it taken out their garbage. This place is not only filthy, but she didn't even eat her bread. She appears to have eaten everything else. It appears that there is a dead body in here, but really the body doesn't appear to be in that bad of shape. Sure, it'll haunt your dreams, but the bad smell could still just be the fridge. It's very easy to investigate a cult that just leaves pictures lying around everywhere. Oh, and she has the lament configuration in her hand. Kirsty must have sent it to her after the events of Hellseeker for no reason. This calls for a nice, stiff drink of Diet 7-Up. I'm not saying the movie is great, but I do relate to any movie that has a lead character who chain smokes just as much as me and spends their nights with VHS tapes of artsy Miramax movies. The tape is a dire warning that says do not open the box. She's gonna open the box. Welp, can't feel sorry for you now. Largely because the effects in this series are still getting worse. And there's Pinhead from a wildly different location, looking more spliced into this movie than in the last two films combined. When we come back, eh, there may be some more Hellraiser connections. Maybe, possibly. Convention season is back, so come see us at the 10th anniversary of Exotica Expo Chicago. We'll be there all weekend with our uncut and uncensored DVDs from July 16th to the 18th. Get your tickets now at ExoticaExpo.com. Wow, things are getting weird around here. You know, maybe it was a bad idea opening the box that was held by a dead body that briefly came to life while the tape she had told me not to open the box. Some things in the movie aren't that bad, though. The musical score in some scenes is kind of good. It's got a real grittiness and 8mm-like atmosphere that the previous two movies had as well. I like the idea that this Tiberius-like sex grotto is located on a moving subway train. She's looking for a man named Winter, who is the leader of the cult. Maybe this understudy for a Harmony Corinne film knows where he's at. Well, I hate complaining that the subway smelled like piss because I think that was intentional. 
And who is this guy following her? Could this be Winter? And why is he making her flashback to the Time After Time music video? What an odd vacation she's on. Eh, that happens every day around this time. You get used to it. The police may think she's crazy, but she's got Charles on her side. Sent directly from the League of Snooty Horror Movie Charleses. Amy, how could you bring me to this dump? Sure, I could have lectured you over the phone, but I took the next flight out to assert myself as the best character in the film. I love Charles because anytime I make him say something crazy, he just says something even crazier on his own. For the average person, the hunger for knowledge is like the hunger for food. We want to know just enough to take the edge off our appetite. I'm imagining you as a big hot dog, Amy. I want to cover you in chili and stuff you with onions. I brought the buns. Now give me a story that will supply the meat. Too bad she doesn't go with him. This guy is a novel of confusing lines. Then walk back to your room, lie in your coffin until the daylight hours have passed, as is your habit. God damn it, Charles, I can't tell if you're hitting on me or not. Amy is a confusing character, too. The hell? That was a whole cigarette. No wonder you go through a carton so fast. Again, she has the right idea of simply going to the nearest horror movie location to find something. The jump scare means you're getting closer. However, be very careful. You may step in shit. Ooh, the crackhead dog might be around here somewhere. Yep, there he is. I heard you stepped on my poo. That makes me awfully sad. I was saving that for lunch and dinner. The Hellraiser connections are thin at best, but there's still some creepy things in this. Lord, I'm not even afraid of bugs and that scene made me jump a little. Are you claustrophobic? Are you afraid of bugs? Well, here's a movie that'll make Temple of Doom feel like a cakewalk to you. She's saved by a horror movie, shh, and is being led somewhere. Could be a Hellraiser movie, could be a Saw film, could be Mortal Kombat. Take your pick. Ah, a cross between The Exorcist and Flatliners. Should have assumed that. It may be the magic powers that make people follow him, but really, it's the respect. Damn, that was badass. I guess she's leaving. What an embarrassing time to forget your camera. I hope it's not a coincidence that the leader of the cult looks a little like Terry from Last House on Dead End Street. Luckily, she brings him the box because I guess even he needs to be reminded this is a Hellraiser movie. One thing added to the final draft, the box is a family heirloom and his name is Winter Le Marchand. Of the magic box, Le Marchands? In the original script, I bet his name was Winter de August. Her destiny is to help Winter access the Cenobites so he can become their new master. The villain, played by Paul Reese, isn't bad, but when he does weird articulate villain speeches, he still doesn't hold a candle to Charles. Sure, he uses the power of jump cuts to make her a human sacrifice, but Charles would have done this over a bed of pudding and had a monologue about Teddy Grahams for some reason. I bet they'll succeed in their mission, the mission of making her teleport right into Candyman. One quick rewrite and she could be Helen now. I'm not sure how she's going to get this story written with someone constantly stabbing her in the back. I'm blaming this guy, power-hungry bastard. Now for a sequence that needs to be in the movie because, hey, it summons Pinhead to actually be in the same room with her. And you may be assured that this is not my hand. I really don't know what this whole debtor cult is. The leader is sacrificing people and wants to open the box. I don't know how this is all connected. It's confusing my soul. But with Kari Wur in this, only one thing can send Winter and Pinhead back to hell where they belong, and that's the portal of time. That is, when she's not trying to cover the fact that she's severely bleeding due to the huge knife wound in her chest. It's doubtful anyone would notice. This train station is normally covered in blood anyway, considering it houses the midnight man-meat train. The blood in the subway is right next to the puddle of semen. This is like the ice cream truck from Inferno, in that I can't show you much from it because there's constantly fucking going on in the background. There's more piles of naked dead bodies here than in an Ilsa film. 
But I can show you that Marla is still alive, yet looks dead. Is it also a zombie film? I'm picking up some heavy Return of the Living Dead 3 vibes from this. The reason Amy is chosen is because of her personal demons, that being her abusive father, because it's only through the power of trauma that the box can be open, according to Winter. I don't trust him. Where's Charles? You said my name, therefore I'm here. You are in my care now. That's the best fucking news I've heard in a long time. Watch your mouth, young lady. Don't humiliate me in front of Dr. Alan Cunning. Well, you look a lot better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Isn't he a delicious bit of scrambled eggs that needs a good mixing with my greasy sausage? Anyway, no, she went through the wrong portal of time. Now she has to find Brad Pitt to learn the secret of the 12 monkeys. I see this is an all-ages mental ward. It seems safe. God, I'm getting a little lightheaded trying to follow this. No peeking. And I think the editor is stealing the patient's meds. Let's cut to a commercial so he can calm down a bit. I'm going to a real-life secret hell world party. <laughs> Hellraisers, let's play! That's what I'm talking about. Look, it's a movie hospital. Just look for the person ominously sitting with their back to you. That's the person you should talk to. See? It's Marla, who had a makeover. Apparently, Winter needs her trauma to open the box because he can't open it. Considering how easy people have made it look in the past, now I think the movie's villain is just dumb. And he needs to stop making people pass out. The whole second half of the film is just the lead waking up in different places. It's here that Amy says, um, can you give me a gun to do this? The girl on the tape had a gun. This seems way more slow and painful. This is bullshit. I'm not going to do this. I am your leader. You do not cut off my no. They do let other Cenobites in the movie, too, so that's good. Pinhead's very nice in the movie, like explaining the movie's connection to the series. Your lineage is that of a craftsman, a maker of toys. So, is he another incarnation of this guy? And if not, did he know the 1996 version of Paul Merchant? Eh, doesn't really matter. If you want to rewrite a climax to a non-Hellraiser movie, just add someone getting chains and hooks shoved through their face. Just my <laughs> but don't spend too much money! Also, best kill the cult members, too. None of them seem like they had any clue as to what Winter's motivation was. They look like they're here for a knockoff of the craft that Pinhead crashes. As for Amy, she kills herself as not to give her soul to Pinhead. Or she's just trying to match the other hole in her chest. Not sure. Also, I'm not sure why this happens. No! Seems like an overreaction. I'm sure you're not dead. Thankfully, one character survives. Just talk to the police. Still nothing. Yes, and what a tragic story this is. Send in the new reporter. I have two tickets to the best subway train in town. Grab your nipple clamps, and I'll grab the car battery and my leather chaps. Oh, and a reporter has the box now. I'm sure that'll never be mentioned again. Though I don't know what the hell the final shot is supposed to mean. By God, Amy and Charles knew each other? Oh, I get it. They were on a boat to the Overlook Hotel this whole time in 1921. Look, we can't afford Midnight with the Stars and You for the soundtrack, so just cut to the end. Okay, so of the DTV Hellraiser movies, Inferno and Hellseeker were better than this, but not much better. Both Hellseeker and Inferno were pretty much the same let's do a Hellraiser by way of Jacob's ladder plotting. And this one doesn't really do that, so it feels a little different in that regard. But it still has the common plot line of it being about someone investigating something and it somehow leads to Pinhead. The three movies do have strong performances, though. Craig Sheffer, Dean Winters, and Kari Wurr were all excellent leads who did a good job of carrying their films. But while you can tell Hellraiser stuff was added to the scripts of the other movies, they kind of blended them in 
fine and made them work with the movie's larger plot lines. Here? No, not only is it wildly obvious this was a rewrite, but it's so crowbarred in, even Pinhead shows up to say, uh, this cult has nothing to do with me. I'm also confused as to why I'm here. Hell, they even just make up new rules about the box. It's a movie about a cult that wants to control Cenobites, though none of them ever really act like they know the Cenobites are even a thing. Kirsty acted out of character in Hellseeker, but she was a big part of the story. Here, Pinhead just says, Uh, you're related to the toy makers. Um, just accept it, I guess. But there is a grittiness to it that I like, and it probably did start out as a fairly decent script. And it certainly wasn't afraid to get sleazy a time or two. And it did give us Charles, so I can't get too mad. Doesn't really matter if it was a hit on video or not, because the movie was made simultaneously with Hellraiser Hellworld. Another film I'm hearing rave reviews about. For fuck's sake. Well, this is the perfect time to be reviewing Hellraiser Hellworld because there's news that Pinhead will be in a new upcoming video game titled Dead by Daylight. I don't know what that game is, but it had better be based on Pinhead's previous video game experience in this movie. The film is the tale of what happens when you have an MMORPG based on Hellraiser and then mix that with a rave. Somehow it will involve dead people and Lance Henriksen. That's just science. As part of a deal to shoot in Romania for Hellraiser Deader, this film was shot back to back with Deader, with a cast that consisted of a lot of actors who happened to be in Romania at the time finishing other projects. Rick Boda, the director of Hellseeker and Deader, returned as director, with Carl Dupre, the writer of Hellseeker, also returning. And, of course, it was based on pre-existing non-Hellraiser-related material, as the movie was based on a short story called Dark Can't Breathe by Joel Swasson, who also wrote the Mimic sequel, the Pulse sequels, that Hollow Man sequel, and the Prophecy sequels. All of those also needed video game tie-ins. This one is starting out strong. Looks like someone is working hard to bury these movies from the continuity. Damn, he was looking for gold, but what he found was the opening credits! This one's gonna be spooky. The credits are in the demonic horror movie font. These people don't look very happy to be going to church on their day off. And the nuns are just dying for a cigarette break. I guess their friend Adam committed suicide or something. I don't know. I only like opening scenes like this when it's playing You Can't Always Get What You Want. It makes sense I'm watching this on the day The Big Chill was released. I see Adam was very popular. Even the nuns are ditching the funeral early. However, this is no reason to be a buzzkill. I'm just great, Mike. Aren't we all just fucking great? You are in a church, mister! Some of this cast looks very familiar. Christ. How many times you had to tell a guy it's just a stupid gang? Hey. I don't care what anyone says, Henry Cavill was the best Mike from Hellraiser Hellworld. They've all been addicted to a game called Hellworld, and it's made them awkward. You should have seen this coming. But we didn't. Stop being weird! Here, make it more awkward by opening the casket. Adam requested to be buried with a jump scare. It's two years later, and they haven't done shit in that time, except have fake-out dream sequences while sleeping on the couch, and also scaring their friends. What? I need to grab a hundred bucks for this thing on the internet. A hundred bucks? Tommy Jarvis would have made that for you for half that price. I can see why they're addicted to this game. The box. You opened it. Okay. The game makers got Pinhead himself to do the voice work! The game invites them to a rave. They only have to do one thing for admission. But Derek and Allison would never waste a perfectly good Friday night in Hellworld. <laughs> Make the humor in the movie like a sitcom. I have several questions, like who took the picture on that shirt? 
Do the Hellraiser movies exist in this universe? <laughs> this game seems exciting. <laughs> it's the most addicting game since Taboo on the NES. With Pinhead's voice in the background, it's the most lines Pinhead has had in any of these direct-to-video sequels. And now they are off to the rave! But first, gotta pick up the year 2005. We got all of the best mid-2000s horror movie music. Ooh, if I had hair, I'd be loading it with chunky highlights! Hellraiser Hell World gives the audience what they want. The much-needed cross between Stay Alive and House of the Dead. Everyone here knows the word Hellraiser. Ugh, I liked Pinhead much better before he sold out and went mainstream. Remember, this is all for Adam. Adam would have loved this. Yes, he loved the Haunted Mansion when it didn't pay its electric bill. Thank God Jake's not here to ruin this good time. Now that's what I call a buzzkill. <laughs> <laughs> this movie's not very deep. So what have you been up to, Jake? Trying to forget the past. Good thing you're at a rave for that game that killed your friend. Who the hell funded this game? Welcome, Hellraiser. Ah, Waylon Utani, I knew it! Lance Hendrickson plays the host of the game, and he's picked the right group of people. Who's a pretty kitty? You're the pretty kitty. Yes, you are. Because we all want to see them die! Jesus, if this many people know about Le Marchand and the box, how have the Cenobites not completely taken over the world by now? Cenobites? Especially when people are so dumb, I'm surprised they haven't broken their own necks tying their shoes. Good thing there's no red flags. That is amazing. Yeah, this is made out of human skin. There's no texture quite like it. It seemed like a good idea to rent out Ed Gein's house for a party. This really is the party to be at. Look, I trust any party that has Ben Tramer on the VIP list. No one is protected in this house. Ursula was the only one they found. If she wasn't all there, he might say she went to pieces. <laughs> and by that, I mean by these damn jokes! Fortunately, they go to the creepiest room in the place. <laughs> it's where they bottle and store unnecessary 2000s editing. He's like the Willy Wonka of the Hellraiser world. The jarred fetuses taste like snozberries. This all seems legit. What the fuck? Oh yeah, now it's weird. They have to keep baby oopsie daisy bottled up for safety. They all think the box is just a myth. As if you would ever want to question Lance Henriksen. Someone in the editing room opened the box, cause I can't tell what's going on! Just know that Pinhead has been edited in there seamlessly. Mike knows exactly how to cue the 2000s horror rock. I need a drink. You know the best part of these jokes? It's not the music. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Ah, timeless! How about more commercials? <laughs> Hellraiser Hellworld will be right back after these messages. Great Halloween parties begin at Walgreens. Candy, party decorations, masks, costumes, makeup. Everything you need for Halloween fun, now at Walgreens. This is like the Halloween resurrection of the Hellraiser franchise, only without the charm of Busta Rhymes kung fu fighting. I sense these characters will have no problem hooking up. I'm not Mr. Right, but I'm Mr. Right now. Jesus, the characters from Hostel would tell them to tone down the douchery. The dialogue may be awful, but so far it's been above, uh, that went well. But when you sober up, I expect an apology. Well, that went well. It was a mistake to give the rights of the Hellraiser series to Chuck Lorre. It's hard for me to feel bad for people this stupid. Uh, yeah, right. As if. And when they belong in a Disney Channel comedy. 
In her defense, she is looking for a creepy old chair that will kill her. Oh, thank God, there's one. Ooh, I have a bad feeling about this. <laughs> My mistake, I'm accidentally reviewing a Saw film. Wow, let's never do that again. <laughs> So is the host also Pinhead, or are they both just weirdly edited into this scene? And who made this game? Plus, I know he's not Pinhead. We were already told James Remar was Pinhead. Good lord, stop wandering off alone. You're never gonna find an orgy. Just stop looking. Ah, perfect. A computer to play SimCity 2000. Wait, this isn't my computer. Where's my 3D maze? Where'd you get this? It was in your basement, caked in semen. Anyway, I should continue doing everything this guy says. <laughs> it's just a game, right? Is it just a game now? And sorry for the cheap box budget. It's very fragile this time. To make matters worse, he witnessed the neighbor killing someone. This is Hitchcockian, mixed with a little 2000s sex comedy. Boobs. Play it cool, Henry Cavill. I'd love to see your puzzle box. Why is this movie stealing lines from the Cock Razor porn parody? They've got slow mo dancing to attend to. Hang on, <laughs> let me hack up another bad joke. <laughs> I'm sure one is coming. Unfortunately, he has asthma and needs the anecdote after Lao Shea poisoned his Budweiser. Obviously, it's fallen down into the creepy basement. It was Freddy that caused his asthma attack, isn't it? This is as good a spot as any to take a nap. He can use the fetuses as a pillow. But don't be surprised if a plastic surgeon wants to make you look like the Joker. That pinhead is always so inventive about killing people. But here, the characters are so annoying, he's going the slasher route and getting the killing over with fast. Which, believe it or not, actually is explained later. This party is going downhill, but the nun looks happy since clearly she got her cigarette break. Eh, a creepy nun in a horror movie. I should definitely investigate this. Nothing bad ever comes out of that. At least he found a better place to lay down than the other guy. The fetus table turned out to be very uncomfortable. And up here you can get so laid. Eyes Nailed Shut is a very underrated Kubrick movie. This makes up for all the other Hellraiser movies' lack of cuddle time. He only gets off to flashbacks of Adam dying, Chelsea, and Lance's soothing voice. And I thought you had a high threshold. Don't worry about Alice. You'll see her again. Meanwhile, the other party members are like, what the hell was that intercom message about? Hurry, we gotta find out what address this is. I need help. I'm at 86 Hellbound Drive. That was less obvious than naming it Hellraiser 3 Hell on Earth Boulevard. You know what? As bad as this movie is... Sorry to bother you at this hour. It's all right. I think. Lance Henriksen is still so damn cool! They brought the best of the best to investigate this. Definitely drugs. Probably speed on map. Well, that's no reason for us to investigate. You continue on with your party and clean up the trash when you're done. With the cops gone, they're still in safe hands. Superman is proving just how much he's the Man of Steel. Unfortunately, he's locked in the fetus room. Haha, <laughs> joke's on you. This only improves my erection. Just... Props. What, is he gonna bang one of them? He finds the body of his friend Derek. This is good news. More women for Mike, if he can get past the dialogue. Your sitcom one-liners will not save you. Definitely a kryptonite hook. If you ask me, Pinhead is losing his step a little. This is just the beginning. 
You're supposed to say that before he dies, not after. The gripping conclusion of Hellraiser Hellworld will continue after this message. So dial this number now if you dare. Talk to me live. And Freddy Krueger is waiting just for you. Two dollars for the first minute, 35 cents each additional minute. Hey, turns out the front door works. Chelsea makes it outside with some hurdles. Like a bad horror movie, isn't it? Yes, as a matter of fact, it's exactly like a bad horror movie. Complete with bad fire effects when we see how Adam died. At least he got a free expansion pack out of it. Good thing there happens to be a cop standing there in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Still don't understand. Oh, I understand. Pinhead is doing a killer Jason Voorhees impression. Sure, she may have gotten out of the house, but thankfully she gets a fake phone call from her friend, which sends her running back into Murder Factory. Ooh, genius points. I feel sorry for none of these people, but we were promised the resurrection of Superman in this film. Not this time, Charles. Great party, huh? Ugh, damn it, this is the version with the Joss Whedon scenes. You don't need me to play you the clip where he says, let's raise some hell. It's a given that that line would be in the film. Wow, you know, on second thought, running back into the house was a really terrible mistake. Chelsea is an important character. She spells things out for the audience. Why don't I just go ahead and call you Pinhead? If that's what you want to think. So you are Pinhead. That obvious line has sealed it for me that he is not Pinhead. Let me guess, you're going to rip off your face and morph into some franchise icon, right? Hmm, clever. I'd make a joke, but what is this? Some kind of internet review or something? She is calling him out for not following the rules of the box. You know, the rules that indicate there's gotta be a classic sitcom misunderstanding. <laughs> Finally, something hilarious, and that wasn't even intended to be funny. Sure, Chelsea is possibly dead, but he still has to find out if the pizza he ordered is here. The fuck is going on? Who the fuck is this? Whoa, Jay, calm down. It's just me, Chelsea. Ooh, she's not dead, and she has his pizza. Again, they talk about the rules of the box not being followed, so what started out as hostile is now Scream, laced with an LSD freakout film. Turns out they've all been poisoned with psychedelics. Somehow he knew they'd be dumb enough to cut themselves on a card and spray themselves in the face with perfume. Is it the hallucinating that's causing them to magically find important information like Adam's stuff? Or to stupidly stick their hands in random holes in the floor? Turns out it's a revenge plot where Host isn't Pinhead, he's Adam's dad who's concocted this elaborate plan to get back at those he feels are responsible for his son's death. Pumpkinhead stopped returning his calls, so he had to contact Pinhead, a game developer now, I guess. But a swift punch off the balcony isn't enough to destroy Lance. It'll still pop up to scare the hell out of you. I know that Pinhead was injected into the previous three movies, but this one definitely feels like it doesn't need him, as it's really just a slasher film about a vengeful dad fucking with these kids. And I found you, Jake, on the internet, in the Hellworld chat room. Oh, the things a young man will tell a prospective lover. I hereby want Lance Henriksen to host to catch a predator. And definitely keep the psychedelic powers. Why did you do this? Revenge. Ah! He's a very straightforward villain in the Hellraiser universe. They almost could say that this does take place in a universe outside the other movies, where someone drugged them to think they're all in a Hellraiser movie, when in reality they were just hallucinating given they died in these caskets from clawing their own necks, fear, or an asthma attack. I'll give it this, didn't really see that explanation coming, but it does make me wish it were in a much better written film because with another rewrite, it could have been the new nightmare of this series. When she's rescued, it sets it all up for the question of, is this really an illusion? Nah, these movies are known for their happy endings about sunrises. That's right, the person who made the phone call to save them was the ghost of Adam who must spend an eternity staring out the window. Eh, I don't think this is an illusion. I think it's just stupid. 
Oh, you want it to get dumber? Why in God's name, after all of that, would you open that damn box? Well, I guess this means it's one of the only Hellraiser movies where Pinhead isn't defeated and screams no at the camera. Though with it being Doug Bradley's last time in a Hellraiser movie, what will his final line in the series be? How's that for a wake-up call? That's... unfortunate. Okay, why is this still going? Why is his ghost haunting them now? I'm sure all of these questions will be answered when Lance Henriksen and Doug Bradley return together in Pumpkinhead Ashes to Ashes. Well, of the existing source material with Pinhead written into them Hellraiser series, this one was the worst. The others weren't great, but they weren't terrible either. This one, I'll say, does have a plot that sticks out from the others, with the other three being investigation films. This one's a straight-up slasher movie that's near close to being the most meta of the series. But with its terrible dialogue and stupid characters, it's hard to give a shit. Although it is funny that out of all the Hellraiser movies, this one's the eighth in the series, yet somehow is by far and away the most dated out of all of them, with all the technology and bad 2000s editing. I'm sure they'll make up for it in the 2011 sequel Hellraiser Revelations. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go drop acid and watch Psych Out! Not because I just watched Hellraiser Hellworld, but because it's Monday. After seeing eight Hellraiser movies ranging from great to not bad to pretty bad, I'm curious to see the one that's considered by many to be the worst. And this is always a good sign. Hellraiser Revelations was released in 2011 and was a rights obligation movie, as Dimension Films had to produce a new movie in order to keep the rights to the franchise and produce one they did, cause they had a little bit of free time, and made this movie in mere weeks. But hey, I'm sure Doug Bradley will still be in the film, right? Oh no no, after being approached about the film, Bradley declined due to how rushed the script and filming schedule was, and that his salary was, in his words, cut down to the price of a fridge. Clive Barker even responded to the film, saying, This is no child of mine. With a script by special effects artist Gary Tunnicliffe, who had previously done effects on Hell on Earth, Bloodline, Hellseeker, Deader, and Hellworld, the movie was directed by Victor Garcia of Return to House on Haunted Hill. And it's got a made-at-the-last-minute type of plot. A couple college kids open the box, and I'm sure a lot of people die. And the time it took me to say all that, I'm sure is the amount of time it took to make the movie. And that sentence was as long as it took to make the opening credits. All right, found footage movies were popular when this came out. The uh, the plan is to to get to get your dick wet. All right, is that okay with you? And so were douchebag lead characters. They have a lot of time to kill on this trip, so they fill it with references. This is going to be an epic journey. My name is uh, Nico Bradley, and this is my best friend Stephen Craven. Their last names are Craven and Bradley, obviously a reference to John Carpenter and Kane Hodder, everyone knows this. They're going to Mexico for several days of partying. Hoo-hoo, I bet they're gonna get in some trouble, considering they're filming everything. We gotta have video evidence of all this, bro, no matter what happens. The fucking car, man! It's been jacked! I don't believe this, I don't Maybe your car just magically turned into a pile of glass. <laughs> Weirder things have happened in a Hellraiser movie, like this. Get the fucking camera off, dude. Oh yeah, this movie is only 75 minutes long. It's moving at a brisk pace so far. Their car gets jacked, and they find the box and open it. What more story do you need? And one of the great things about Doug Bradley was his ability to rewrite or improvise some pinhead lines to make them more authentic to the character. In this film... What? Hey, hey it's, it's yours. Just get the fuck out of here. No. Nico! This pinhead just cuts right to the chase and says no. 
If we move the camera around a lot and not focus on him, we won't be able to tell it isn't Doug Bradley. The movie is often called a found footage movie, even though it's not really. That's just in the first five minutes, which tells me a lot of people watched only the first part of it and shut it off. Understandable. It's a year later, and the Craven and Bradley families have come together for dinner, obviously to celebrate that they don't have to deal with their asshole sons anymore. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, honey. See? They seem fine with their missing kids. Though Emma wants to be the buzzkill of the party. Please what, Dad? What, please forget that I had a brother? Please forget that my boyfriend disappeared with him? Ugh, when you're an adult like us, you'll realize the simple pleasures of a turkey dinner to forget your disappointing children. Pinhead must have baby monitors in the house since he's still listening. This time around, Pinhead is played by Stephen Smith Collins. It's a terrible film, but I gotta show some love for Chicago actors. Though the editing here is questionable. When it cuts back to their conversation after cutting to Pinhead, some of their guests are randomly gone. Where'd they go? And at least it was nice of Pinhead to mail them the video footage of Nico and Steven to taunt them. There is no better buzz than a tequila buzz. That is true. They all it. My God, her parents were right. These guys are idiots. And wait, who is shooting this footage? Is she watching this from these angles too? Do you I'll be your boyfriend. speak? I'm not. I'm Yo, you abloso English. She doesn't understand a word I'm saying. Can we just admit there's probably 5,000 reasons these two went missing, and they don't necessarily have to do with Pinhead. Here's how they made the movie so quick. Just ramble your lines out and make one of them hold the video camera so we don't have to worry about setting up a shot. And that's when Emma found out her boyfriend was a douche. Although a tragedy happens the next morning. Oh shit, bro. She threw up a Bloody Mary all over the toilet. Wait, wait, bro. Wait. Something terrible has happened, so we should get the video camera and record for no reason. What the fucking deleting shit? Dude, we gotta delete that! Right? We need to show this to our kids someday. And we can finally send our family back a souvenir. You're right. Interesting that this is a movie that was always intended to be a Hellraiser film, yet the last four Pinhead spliced sequels put Pinhead into the scenes better than this. Whenever it shows the family here and cuts to Pinhead, it looks like B-roll of the actor just listening to direction from the director and not saying anything. Emma's having the worst night. They didn't even invite her into the lounge for dessert. Seems like as good a time as any to open the box. Might as well. Pinhead is just hanging out in the attic anyway. Then the real hell breaks loose. Guys, it's Steven! Oh, great. It's our idiot kid. Guess you're gonna want dinner or something. Get him over to the couch and pump him with 50 cc's of cheese and wine immediately. You know what would be great? If you somehow combine this with Kirk Cameron saving Christmas. Yes, yes, Kirk can still do the worm at the party. He just actually has to turn into a worm. When we come back, maybe Pinhead will tidy up the attic a little bit. So we've provided our account representatives with the skills and equipment they need to take a company's problems and our solutions to them and fit them together into a total communication system. The system is the solution. They want to ask Steven about where he's been, but they know it will just turn into a long story involving getting so wasted and so laid. Now quick, wrap him up tight. The twist is they're cannibals and want to devour him like a burrito. That is, when the Cenobites are done doing whatever it is they're doing. Start sucking. Better than what's going on in the living room. Hell, I'll shoot anyone who comes close. You're drunk, Peter. So what? So I don't want any accidents happening. We're tired of you pissing yourself and shitting on the floor. We have other things going on now. This is like watching Pinhead interrupt a soap opera. Just think of the new Pinhead like a twin brother reveal. I'll give it this, it's directed by a makeup artist, so the effects aren't bad in the movie. The dubbing is okay, given Pinhead is dubbed by voice actor Fred Tadaschior. Even through all of this, she still wants to take time out to open the puzzle box. What 
did you do? Is everyone in our family a moron? The way this is edited, it looks like Cenobites are contractors they hired to build an extension on their garage. They breathe a sigh of relief when Steven is missing again. Whew, I thought we were gonna have to feed him our leftovers. Oh, there's the jackass. Mopey asshole is staring at the pool again. They're coming. The ones that creepy bastard. Yeah, the pool is deeper than you. Are you gonna jump in or not? But anyway, back to very bad things, Tijuana edition, where things are getting weirder. That seems to me you could use a friend right now. Yeah, okay, nice costume. Halloween was last week! The homeless guy gives them the box. Was the studio also under an obligation to make a Mulholland Drive sequel? He's really saying great things about this box. What, like sex? I don't know, it's better than that, it's better than sex. Uh, I'm sure the reality is more of a some old bullshit. But we gotta keep this plot going, even though this is a flashback and we already know where it goes. How does it work? You really don't have to do anything. Just rub it and it usually opens on its own. It's quite an easy puzzle box. Now get the camera, bro. We need this for exposition reasons when our parents watch the footage later on. The box is really helping them out. They can put this video on YouTube, and the hits will get them enough money to get back home. And thanks for re-showing us the best line in the movie. Hey, take it. It's yours. Just get the fuck out of here. No. Nico! Yes, the soon-to-be classic pinhead line. No. So anyway, that's the story about when your son banged a girl in the bathroom. She turned up dead and some monsters put hooks in his face. Now let me tell you about the time I hooked up in an alley. I took her back to my place, but I assure you I was thinking about your son the whole time. Also, I killed her because I'm a serial killer now. Her blood brought back your son, though. It's just like Frank from the first one, only if Frank was an obnoxious side character from Porky's Revenge. Okay, that's enough stories. Let's put him back to bed with all the trophies he won for binge drinking. They try something the other movies didn't do. They break out the dictionary. Cenobite, it says here, a member of a religious group living together in a monastic community. Oh my god, crazy. We'll get even more information by looking up Pinhead on Wikipedia. It'll explain their terrible flashbacks to this Amsterdam S&M dungeon they visited. Here, we brought you a turkey leg and a side of Miracle Whip, just like you always liked. Add in a couple extra lines of dialogue and you could make this a Thanksgiving movie. But about that box... What is it? A key. I'm sure there's no reason you're being this cryptic. See, it wasn't weird enough when she opened it the first time. Let's try it yet again. You have to desire it. <sighs> also, it gives them orgasms now. Seriously, is this a soap opera? If you're gonna bang my daughter, could you at least do it after we've had the souffle? Sadly, the night gets worse. They're out of turkey legs, so here's a bowl of weak old corn chowder. And thanks for reminding me I should be watching Amityville 2 instead, when he clearly wants to bang his sister as he seductively drinks that chowder. You can tell this family was very close. I miss you both so much. Yes, okay, I believe you. She seems more passionate about the box. I love that thing. It's so cool. When I touch it, I... It makes me want to bang my brother. So, okay, he's clearly evil. No one drinks chowder without a straw. And let me wipe that corn off of your face. Mm. You can really taste the butter and potatoes. Good God, this scene would be less awkward if Pinhead was watching and pleasured himself by flaying his own dick. See what I mean? When the two make out, it's a step up when he loses his skin in the middle. The parents are very frustrated. They've polished off three bottles of scotch, and if anything, they're more confused now. Is anybody out here? And they hear raccoons getting into their garbage. Oh, the homeless guy shows back up. See, this is Nico and Steven's fault. They gave that guy some change for the box, and now he's back to ask for more. 
Only one way to settle this. Damn it, Dad, can you stop escalating things quickly? You just woke me up. Also, it's a slasher movie now about a crazy homeless guy. Judging by how the dude looks, the studio also mandated a sequel to The Fisher King. Quick, get him inside and pour chowder on his face so he'll be cured and Emma will have sex with him. So I guess that guy is dead. I'd mention his character's name, but I don't even remember what his face looked like before, let alone his name. Can you guys keep it down in here? I'm trying to sleep and masturbate to thoughts of my sister. Oh. There, maybe now you'll be quiet. Seems like all of this would have gone on regardless of Pinhead. These families were waiting to remake House on the Edge of the Park. I'm starting to think that Steven isn't really Steven. We'll get to the obvious twist after the commercial. Thursday, from New York, Hawaii, Detroit, and Toronto, join your favorite CBS stars for the 28th Annual All-American Thanksgiving Day Parade. And now the tale continues of seducing and killing hookers like a south-of-the-border brain that wouldn't die. There's only 22 minutes left, and mainly I'm just wondering how many of those minutes will be the end credits. This seems like a 10 minutes worth of slow crawling credits kind of movie. Unfortunately, he can't kill her because it turns out she has a baby. That's where he draws the line. But Nico needs more flesh because he's starting to stain his new hoodie. I'm sensing a third act breakup between these two. I've given you shirt off my back. Oh, ha ha, cute joke. I'm gonna kill you and take your flesh for saying dumb lines like that at the wrong time. So yeah, the twist is that Stephen is actually Nico, for as it says in the Bible, Jesus wept and took his face off. Not much to say here. This is all just him taunting them with a shotgun. <laughs> oh, and there's more soap opera secrets, too. How about an apology? For what? For fucking my mother and ruining both of our families. Yeah, I have a hole in my chest. I don't care if you talk about my infidelities. In case you don't know Steven is Nico, it flashes back and shows the real Steven dying. Thanks for that. I was so confused. He wants the box back or he's gonna shoot someone else with that pellet gun. They've already opened the box several times, but hey, let's go ahead and do it yet again. Only this time with candles. That'll make it more evil. If I'm being nice again, I guess the box effects are better here than in a few of the other direct-to-video sequels where it looked like cardboard. Finally, they're taken to the land of the Cenobites, where they see their attic for the first time since moving in. But who the Cenobites really want is Nico, since Steven is now among them. And honestly, his pinhead-style makeup is better than the actual pinhead in the movie. The gore effects are also a little better than in some of the other direct-to-video sequels, too, where there would be some bad CG going on. Don't get me wrong, this is still the worst one. I'm just glad I'm not seeing bad CGI chains flying around all over the place. Still not feeling this pinhead, though. Compared to the onslaught of agony that awaits at our hands. Why does he look like he's flirting with them at a costume party? How will they get out of this one? Okay, shooting Nico, sure. This actually bites them in the ass, since their debt would have been paid with Nico, but now they have to be terrorized. No, no, please take me. No. Wrong, wrong, wrong. It's the last act. He's not supposed to say no. He's supposed to scream, no! Also, they claim the wife's soul, and he will not hear the end of this at next year's Thanksgiving dinner. Until then, I want to see the more interesting movie. The one where she has to explain to authorities how all of this happened. If you get Detective Craig Sheffer, he'll understand. It'd be more understandable than this abrupt ending. Pfft, okay, sure. Very nice, ran out of money ending.
And in case you're wondering, it's five minutes of end credits. So yeah, on the plus side, it was written as a Hellraiser sequel. On the downside, it's definitely the worst one, and the scores clearly show. This is like someone wanted to write off a dinner party, so they just shot a quick Hellraiser movie over a weekend by throwing movies like Hellraiser, The Dinner, and Funny Games into a blender. The gore effects are good, but there's no grit to this movie, as it's shot like you're watching a generic basic cable TV series. Some of the Cenobite scenes are unintentionally funny, and they did way more with Pinhead in the movie scripts that he didn't even start out in. Here, it looks like they just filmed Pinhead for a few hours in an empty office at a rented-out studio. But hey, they still got to keep the rights for the franchise, which led to the 10th film, Hellraiser Judgment, made in 2018, also to keep the rights for the franchise. Though I hear this one is better. Though I really hope that the running time in that film is also reduced by again having Pinhead give very simple one-word answers. <laughs> Fool. <laughs> Well, after catching COVID, it looks like it's back to filming in the closet for me, though this one is much better. I can sit in front of it, plus put posters in the background. I left my suit near my snob chair, but luckily, this closet is filled with old onesies. And it's a special occasion, too. We have reached the tenth and final film in the Hellraiser movie series, Hellraiser Judgment. The movie that does have a familiar name attached to it, it was written and directed by makeup artist Gary Tunnicliffe, who also had writing credits on Revelations and Debtor, and he certainly wanted a chance at making a truer Hellraiser follow-up with Judgment. While the studio initially passed, after some negotiations, he was allowed to make the film, as like with Revelations, it's another movie in the Hellraiser series that had to be made in order for the studio to keep the rights. With it being a movie about detectives searching for a serial killer, it does kinda sound like a Hellraiser movie of the 2000s era, though it did get better reviews than the previous film in the series. Why not? Doesn't matter what the opening scene is, it'll immediately be better than the last! Obsolete. Irrelevant. In an age when desire has become amplified. Ooh, it is a detective story. Pinhead is talking from witness protection. And he's talking to Paul Schaefer, obviously. Plus, we get a glimpse here of the new Pinhead actor, Paul T. Taylor. Who, no offense to Stephen Smith Collins, but Taylor does look more the part. Pinhead and the Auditor are talking about the best way to harvest more souls. Isn't it obvious? Go old school, like a chain letter that has to be sent in the mail. Let's screw with notorious pervert Carl by having him go to some address. According to this cut, it works out. The house is right in front of him. Wait, 55 Ludovico? Sure, it's down the road from the Corova Milk Bar and 1010 Ultra Violence Way. Carl should have seen the warning signs. You go into a place like this, obviously some creep will want to reenact famous scenes from Manhunter. This here is Hell's Inquisition, where the auditor takes notes of all the sins committed by those in his chair. August 18th, 2001, you lured little Courtney Redlison to your car. Why? Uh, uh, how else was I supposed to give away my leftover Halloween candy? <laughs> sure, this is all very threatening and all. I will spend some on you. If you like. But at least the auditor is polite about it. Carl goes through all of his sins. I'm not sure who has it worse. Carl or the auditor who has to type out all of this instead of just recording it on his phone. Anyway, psych, you're at a crack house with an even bigger weirdo. Tears of children. Ugh, stop being creepy and go back to selling snake oil and that thing. I have no idea what's going on, but in no way, shape, or form does it make me want to eat paper. Maybe if the movie was a little bit better. I'll give it this, it does feel more like a Hellraiser movie. 
Too bad I can't show you the part where three topless women run their fingers through vomit. This is a step up from Revelations, looking like a Hellraiser fan film. Hell, this one is like a Stranger Danger movie for adults. It doesn't matter how old you are, if you get a letter saying to go to an abandoned house, don't go to it. Naked, tattooed women will eat you alive while a cross between Mr. Freeze and the Punisher's Jigsaw watches. As for Pinhead, he'll be taking a nap while the rest of it is taken care of by the large babies from Nothing But Trouble. I still have no idea what's going on, and it's getting more random! Wow, the credit scene from Girl with the Dragon Tattoo was awesome! After he gets his skin peeled from his flesh and then the blood squirted on the topless women that I can't show, I assume he's dead, but you never know with these movies. I was gonna make a joke about how this is just the screenwriter, don't mind him, but that actually is Gary Tunnicliffe playing the auditor. The best part, though... All of that was just the opening scene! Kudos to bringing cool opening credit sequences back to the series, even if it's your stock post-7 serial killer movie credits. Once the credits end, though, we can continue on with the movie. Uber black my ass! See? My hooker has arrived to watch Hellraiser Judgment with me! Uh-oh, someone's in her apartment. What? Candles? Obviously a booty call. This weirdo in the dark thing is only a turn on for like a few minutes. Agreed, intruders are only sexy for the first few minutes. And then it gets very, very unsexy. Thankfully, brother detectives Sean and David Carter are on the case. They will defeat evil with their banter. A what? Charles Dickens. Right. Like anyone reads that shit anymore? Right? There were only like three Christmas Carol adaptations on Hallmark this year. Oh, do you need it to be more like seven other than the credits? The killer thereafter is named the Preceptor who kills people based on the Ten Commandments. Take that, Seven Deadly Sins. We got three more victims than you. However, our boys will need some help. Doesn't this seem a bit basic for the Preceptor? The fuck are you? What are you doing creeping around a murder scene at nighttime? And furthermore, why are there very few people at this high-profile crime scene? Detective Edgerton joins them to get to the good stuff. See, it's just like in the Bible. The preceptor sewed a dog into her. That is, if your Bible is American Psycho. When we come back, these detective stories in Hellraiser movies never end happily. We'll be right back. Now that we're back, are you all moved in yet? Nice. It's a very... 1940s detective agency. Right, you can tell by the 40s computer monitor. I'm glad that Randy Wayne is here. That makes sense, I'm still wearing my Christmas onesie. He was in a Christmas movie, Christmas, which also features Brant Doherty from Merry Kissmas. As for the other cop, he's so obsessed with this case, he forgets his wife's birthday. Happy birthday to me. What? You found the wine and pack of cigarettes he got for you. Oh yeah, and something else was in the body's abdomen. I'm guessing leftover bacon strips from the dog. And just what the hell does the preceptor mean? A precept is a teacher, responsible to uphold law or tradition in this case. <laughs> okay, thanks. That guy did it. I have faith in these detectives. They've got a montage of them solving the case. They'll find the killer any minute now. Mm-hmm, not quick enough. Whoever that is is totally dead. This is what happens when you only have three detectives on the case. You'll find mysterious jars of blood and severed hands. But little do they know, that just means it's an antique playground. We all grew up with slides covered in blood. 
It's been a few minutes since we've had a pinhead cutaway, so here he is either masturbating to the crime scenes or waiting for his butler to bring him a tape to test his surround sound. The cops think that creepy flasher Carl might be the suspect, but of course he's gonna be one of the victims. He lives on Slasher Movie Lane. Look who the landlady is. He's not in. That cocksucker owes me two months rent. He hasn't been here for a couple days. Holy shit, it's Heather Nancy Camp! The new evidence calls for another movie reference. Let's get that back to the lab. Mm -hmm. I don't need to yell on Watkins. In the meantime, let's hit the usual suspects. No, no, we're doing seven here, not the usual suspects. Wrong Kevin Spacey movie. All of this leads them to a place where they go for the little of the old in-out, in-out. No reason to go here without backup. At Ludovico, you're welcomed by Ludwig Van. At least it's not the Ninth Symphony. I'm just kidding. Like I said, people need to stop going to Murder House alone. Sure, there hasn't been much pinhead in this, but Gary Tunnicliffe, no stranger to doing good work with effects, also does a decent acting job here. I like the introduction of this auditor character into the Hellraiser universe. You could honestly make a whole movie out of this character having to listen to people's sins. I was 25. The bullet hit him in the throat. And then I was partnered with a talking dog. And I love it when they get into a Bible quote off. And God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man. Ecclesiastes 317. Deuteronomy 21.9. <laughs> Dude looks like me reviewing Rocket's Your Decision, only if I got smashed in the face with a cactus first. He is a nice enough host. He lets people sleep it off in the chair. Before old crackhead Kurt comes in to be weird again, and eat more sheets of paper doused in delicious Alfredo. Still better than doing the one chip challenge. I'm kind of enjoying this random batshit movie. This is like if the Cenobites took over the house from people under the stairs, and if a Skinamax movie was hanging out upstairs, and if he let the naked cannibal girls from Bloodsucking Freaks pour expired Mountain Dew distortion down his throat. But whatever you do, don't interrupt Pinhead when he's listening to his tunes. Ne pinhead no bada. Yeah, this pinhead is okay, but he still just sounds very, very tired. I need your assistance with your, your guidance. What? Yeah, just, just wake me up when you find him, okay? He's so tired. Unfortunately, he's gonna have to stay awake a little longer, as there's more clues. Yeah, just hand me the paper, okay? Maybe that says where Sean escaped to. Eat this in remembrance of my body. Whoa, what was on that paper? I am fully charged from this acid paper! So anyway, Sean escaped and he needs whiskey fast. It's 2.30 in the morning. Okay, stop pretending like any of you go to bed before 2.30. He does return to the house with no backup, and not even explaining to his partner what they're doing there in the first place. God damn it, you don't understand. The naked girls were here, the trough of vomit was there, and the mini bar was over here. If you think he's disappointed, he's not. He knows he's got some good booze stored up at home, and wait, what? You took the box? You would have been better off if you took a wooden splinter riddled in rabies and termites. I think I know why Pinhead wants this guy. He's jealous of the big comfy bed Sean gets to sleep in. They like it super cold in there too. That's why the Cenobites sent in the chatterer on the case. <laughs> and why they woke him up making eggs benedict with his eye sockets. I know, a nightmare like that always puts me in the mood for lovemaking. You're banging the Cenobites, bro. Yeah, sure, a lot of this feels like one of the many standalone Hellraiser sequels with Pinhead spliced into it, but a quick rewrite, and you probably could have made this a direct sequel to Inferno. For instance, you just have to put a cowboy hat and a duster on one of these demons. Hell, you could almost put it in SVU territory as Ice-T shows up in the commercial breaks in one of his Car Shield commercials. 
And when we come back, I still don't think it'll end happy. Freddy Freaker, dancing new sensation. Grabbing the nation, doing the freak. Call now, 1-900-490-FREAK. Join the party. Meanwhile, David is visiting the same empty cup coffee stand I'm sure he used in his Christmas movies. He begins suspecting his brother. I think I know where she's getting her sources from. She looked at the Wikipedia page which credited the actor as also being the killer. As for her, I don't know what side she's working for. She's in a Hellraiser movie, but was also in the recent God's Not Dead movie. Please say it's the same universe. David is completely out of his jurisdiction, though. This street sign isn't referencing a Clockwork Orange at all. Where is he gonna find his brother? Oh, there he is. Throughout all of this, though, at least they still have each other. Sean? No one is judging you. Are you sure about that? The name of the movie is Judgment. It's not looking good for Sean. David finds a highlighted passage when the first letter from the Perceptor read like this. I will bring back the wrath of the Almighty. I will be the plague of retribution. It will be the season of darkness and winter of despair. I knew it. Van Morrison was the killer. No time for that now. They've got another crime scene that I'm sure will involve something horrible, stuck up something else horrible, and we'll all vomit. What is with this town? And yes, someone did die horribly. Medical examiner. Found crystal landing cell phone. Wedged down her throat. Oh my fucking god! But the cell phone being lodged in the throat at least gives them the location of the killer. Here, we need to break into this place so I can reveal to you that I am the killer. My god, the bastard. I know what's going on here. The sick freak is trying to create his own Charlie meme. What? Sean did it. And he needed his neck cracked? I don't know if I would have predicted that he was the killer or that his brother was sleeping with his wife had it not been spoiled by simply looking up the cast on Wikipedia. If you're wondering how David figured out it was him... God will judge the righteous man. God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. Let's just say he also figured it out from Wikipedia. And now his wife is held hostage too. God damn it, people, stop going into abandoned buildings! Damon Carney is quite good in this. He's got a Billy Burke, Aaron Eckhart style of being burnt out and creepy when talking about over-the-top crime scenes. So I cut his eyelids off and burned him alive in his own car. Jesus Christ! He even forces them to open the box. I wonder if the movie will have good box effects or bad box effects. Uh, the effects are fine. Yeah, I was just in a steam. Uh, the acid wore off. What time is it? This hot air really drains my energy. Sean wants to offer a trade of their souls for his, but sorry, that's not the Christmas way, even if it weren't after Christmas. So... Ah, he's dead. But not before other characters are just confused by all of this. What the fuck is going on? Silence. You mind? I'm working overtime here. And this is where it gets complicated, even more so. The angel Jophiel appears to say that heaven needs Sean because he causes fear in sinners. But Pinhead is gonna make him pay like he always does in these. Well, that was quick. Pinhead still hasn't gotten his eight hours of sleep. He just wants Sean dead and fast. Unfortunately, Pinhead causing a quick death gets him in trouble with God, and killing the angel isn't gonna help either. Even though I think we know what this callback means. Jesus. Holy shit, she was the Scorpio killer this whole time. Need it to be more complicated? God banishes Pinhead from hell and makes him return to Earth as a mortal. No! Maybe it does end happy. This should be good news for Pinhead. No more jamming pins into his brain when he bumps his head. Go figure, the final movie in the series is one with a cliffhanger of an ending between Pinhead returning as human and also this post-credit scene. Good morning. 
Dürfen wir reinkommen, um ihnen die gute Nachricht Gottes zu teilen? Why didn't we get an 11th movie? Do you know how awesome Hellraiser vs. Mormons could have been? And we all know he comes back anyway, because he's got to make it to space in the future. So this one was a step up in the, yeah, it's pretty much like the direct-to-video 2000s entries. And if you need to be caught up on all of those, this one wasn't bad, that wasn't bad, this wasn't bad, this was kind of bad, this was really bad. And this one, yeah, again, not bad. The Auditor character was great. This Pinhead felt more like Pinhead, though still not being as great as Doug Bradley. And there was something about his contacts that made a lot of scenes feel like the actor couldn't see much in front of him. I'm curious where the upcoming TV version will go, but I would still like to see Tunnicliffe return for a follow-up to this film. As for what's coming up on the Cinema Snob, well, probably we'll grab one of the other old onesies since this one's already riding up my ass. Plus, uh, there is a new Scream movie coming out to theaters, so might as well watch the first one in that series. <laughs> Amateurs. You know what, just for old time's sake, this Hellraiser reboot should go the route of the insert Pinhead into unrelated scripts era. Just simply put Pinhead into an episode of Stranger Things or the Goldbergs for some reason. The kids love that shit! Work on a Hellraiser remake goes all the way back to 2006 while also taking a week or two in 2011 and 2018 to make some sequels to keep the rights. Hell, there have been so many names attached to this that when I talked about a potential remake in my review for the original, I probably said that Camera Head from Part 3 was attached to Direct. At one point, the film was called Clive Barker Presents Hellraiser, and the directors were Julian Mari and Alexander Bastilio of Inside. Though with Dimension being dissatisfied with the script, Marcus Dunstan and Patrick Melton of Feast jumped on board for a rewrite, but left when the studio wanted the movie to be aimed at teenagers. There was even an official announcement that Patrick Lussier and Todd Farmer of My Bloody Valentine 3D and Drive Angry were going to take over the project. That again didn't happen, and at one point Barker announced he himself would direct and write the film. Still not too late to just insert Pinhead into an unmade Friday the 13th script. At this point, I'm sure the movie was eventually offered to the ghost of James Whale. Eventually, they got the ball rolling again after the success of the 2018 Halloween and put it in good hands, with it being directed by David Bruckner, who directed a great film from 2007 called The Signal, and also 2020's The Night House, which was damn good. The film's writers, Ben Collins and Luke Leotrowski, also worked on The Night House, and it's a franchise movie, so of course David Goyer's name is attached. The movie opens up in Serbia. Wait, I've been wrong this whole time. They just inserted Pinhead into a Serbian film. We have such sights that you really don't want to see. The more sinister this exchange is, the more it will be overcast and rainy. They have acquired the box for sleazy millionaire Roland Voigt for his house party. Already I can tell this is going to be the best slasher film of 2010. Poor Joey isn't having as good a time as the rest. Enjoying yourself? Um, yeah. He just has the sneaking suspicion his flesh will be ripped off. Yeah, I know there'll be some hostile shit going on here, but I need the money, and the architecture is really cool. Is the twist that it's taking place inside the box this whole time? There's always some rich guy obsessed with the box, and here it's Gorn Viznik as Mr. Voigt. He's testing out the boxes on male models to perfect them before he uses them to destroy James Bond. So if I solve it, do I get a prize? I do. Oh well, in that case, there's no time to waste. Of course I'll solve this prank box that stabs me in the hand. And in true Hellraiser fashion, a slight prick on the hand isn't the only thing that happens. However, not in true Hellraiser fashion, Joey is mostly off-screen to death, except for being a bit blurry in the background. Six years later is when it gets more awkward, with our lead Riley, who is with her brother and friends, while they were waiting patiently for her and Trevor to finish banging in the bedroom. 
You guys just heard us fucking. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We insisted on staying and not leaving. It goes the Evil Dead remake route, with our lead being an addict and her friends trying to help. Don't take away all my vices and fucking keep guy for Christ's sake. Did you really just turn down the TV to listen to us argue? Well, you just listened to her have sex, so why not? They all want her to stop seeing Trevor, but look at the size of his place. He seems to be well off. He's got a pinball machine. They still need more, though, so they break into a warehouse to steal some shit. They're either gonna find the puzzle box, or they're gonna find the demonic toys. It could go either way. It's a foolproof plan! What do you mean, what about that? Do you know the combination? Relax, I've seen Ocean's Eleven. We can break into the safe by just beating it a few times. It's very, very easy to solve, much like the box. He's gonna be the first one to attempt solving the puzzle by just beating it with a crowbar. But really, it's the angry words that pierce deeper than the chains. Pack your shit. Get the fuck out of my house. You're moving into the billiards room! I appreciate the movie doing its own plot, not going the straight-up remake or remake will route. Given how the other sequels past four didn't really tie into one another, this movie could also work as being another sequel. And it's easy for the box to seduce people in this one. You could convince a person it's a new type of fidget cube, though the piercing of the finger and the blade popping up is gonna do nothing for your anxiety. Nor are the Cenobites who show up. We get our first glimpse of Pinhead here, not credited as lead Cenobite, but instead the priest who demands sacrifices, or at least to hand someone pamphlets for their church. When we come back, her brother will get a severe infection from washing his wound in the dirty bathroom. America's newest ball game. <laughs> Screwball's a puzzle that's easy to take apart, but hard to put together. I don't think it can be done. That's a little guy in the end doodle. He's not saying anything. Just pepper in the Super Bowl ball. It's all fouled up. <laughs> I don't know how to work a screwball. Hey, look at him. He's done it. Screwball, America's newest ball game. Can I have your autograph? Me too. Give <laughs> me one for my mother. We're back. Was he able to properly dress the cut on his hand? <laughs> Yes, but he saw a really big spider in the bathroom. It'll be very hard to explain this to the police. She doesn't know what happened. He was also off-screened. I do like some of what they're doing here, where it's hard for them to believe anything she says about her brother or the box because they assume she's high. Odessa Azian is very good in the movie. Her character is taking the news well. It means she and Trevor can have sex again, this time without her brother listening. Sure, there was a Cenobite there, but it's still less weird than her brother. There is good stuff about her being genuinely confused as to why she's seeing shit, considering she's not on drugs in this scene. But I'm on Trevor's side. Here, you try. Fuck, no. Finally, someone who doesn't want to touch that sinister box! It does sort of feel like it's one of the direct-to-video sequels, where it's almost a procedural about investigating the puzzle, like here when they question the lawyer who's dying in the hospital. And as these scenes usually go, the person is vague and saying, Who the hell opened this, you stupid shits? The themes of addiction are good, like everyone needing this box and then hurting themselves. And it's a fairly well-shot movie with some cool visuals. That is not going to be good for her health. They bring on the appearance of Pinhead slowly, instead of forcing the character into it a lot and quickly. It even throws in some music cues from the first two movies, which is kind of cool. There's still too much off-screen carnage. I just saw Terrifier 2 last week where audiences are vomiting in the seats. This Hellraiser needs to step it up on the gore. I still like Trevor, who after finding out that Voight has been missing for six years, says this. Yeah, fuck. We need to get rid of that thing, Riley, all right? <sighs> Thank you. Throw that thing in the trash! He is out of here like, nope! Some movies you just know there will be an aerial view shot where the lead is driving somewhere to investigate shit. In this case, let's check out Graceland. She's obviously way too early for the next mansion party. They haven't even finished cleaning up all the blood from Joey's corpse. And stop touching shit that's not yours! It really is the perfect place to find out more about the Cenobites. This room is where all the concept art is, and the script notes as well. This proves worth it as she sort of finds her brother. Is it really you? Do you want it to be? 
Well, that's clearly the right answer. Good to see you again, bro. This even summons the rest of her friends. They knew she'd be in the same room with the pool table. And we need far more young people to kill in the film. Does someone even live in this place? I mean, what is this? Right? What are we even doing here? You're here to die. Did you not hear what I said? But going into an abandoned mansion to save your addict friend doesn't mean you can't serve up a couple of drinks at the dusty bar. You're gonna need a few before more exposition. So according to Void, the puzzle box, it has six sides. Whoever possesses the final configuration is granted a passage to another realm, to an audience with God. What? What does God need with a puzzle box? I'm sorry, your words aren't making any sense. Life, knowledge, love, sensation, power, you see where I'm going? No. <laughs> Sounds like someone has about 10 Hellraiser movies they need to catch up on. Here, we'll throw in a death scene to bring you up to speed. Luckily, we've got Trevor here to help. See? He put on some music. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here, but the piano is very lovely. People have just been opening the box for years, when it's way simpler to just stab someone with its spike the whole time. We've been shoving chains in it for decades, and it's harder than you think. Still, they got the right idea. Bolt, bolt, bolt! She knows they need to focus on the road, so it's very nice of her to drift elsewhere as not to distract them. Now we can finally see the character we came here for. The Chatterer, of course. I know that clicking jaw sound anywhere. Oh, and also Pinhead. What? Pinhead? You're hot. What is it you pray for? <laughs> a sequel to the animal. Bless you, devil. It took the movie a while, but this scene is pretty intense. And while she tried to keep it down back there, her exploding body did indeed cause an accident. Now is definitely the time to talk about whose fault this is. You shouldn't be here right now. You guys should be here. We don't have time for this, okay? We don't have time for this. I'm sorry, but we don't. More words of wisdom from Trevor. Throw that damn thing somewhere. Just not sure where. The movie is a little too dark. We wish to see you proceed. Me too. Turn the lighting up. Jamie Clayton is a pretty good pinhead. Certainly the best since Doug Bradley, with the Revelations pinhead being not so great, and Judgment pinhead being okay, just kind of stock. She definitely stands out, while looking like the offspring of original Pinhead and the female Cenobite from Part 2. However, it's gonna get awkward again when she has to break the news about one of them being offered up as a sacrifice. <laughs> Causing the characters to shit their pants is the main motivation of the Cenobites. But are they gonna kill Trevor? Boo! You can't do that, then I'd be stuck with characters who I don't remember their name! Thank God he's holding on for dear life. They got some good ideas in them, like locking the doors and closing the gates. Oh, well, shit. Uh, do you have a key? I hope that Trevor is the survivor here by simply laying down and sleeping all of this off. He's even welcomed into the house by Voight. It's not exactly what was supposed to happen, but listen. Whoa, what? Trevor betrayed them and lured them here? Eh, he's still my favorite character. Though I don't know if this movie needs 37 minutes left, considering now I'm sure Trevor will be the one she offers up as a sacrifice. Also, Voight's part clock now. As for their plan, they're going with the idea of trapping a Cenobite. Please let it be from putting the box under a large cardboard box. Then when a Cenobite grabs it, they pull the stick out from under it. Or lure one inside, like they've come in for the smell of a delicious bowl of chicken soup. And when we come back, this Cenobite will continue to be annoyed and pissed off. Puss 3D, going up! Puss 3D, the fully dimensional puzzle that's challenging every inch of the way. It's going up, going up! Now that we're back... I think it's stuck! Just kill the fucking thing! Evil Trevor is still giving good advice. Also, did that guy die? Maybe. I don't know. Whenever I think someone is dead, they're fine. See? He's fine. However, she's very disappointed in Trevor's betrayal. How could you do that? Why would you do that? Sorry. But he's sorry, though. See? It's all good. Also, we do find out how Voight turned into part man, part cheese grater. 
I like when he tries to get away and is like, oh right, they're outside. Um, hmm, gonna go hide in the kitchen for a while. While it isn't as good as some of the director's other movies I saw, there are still parts that are impressive looking, and it's good to see a Hellraiser movie back with this kind of ambition, at least with its cinematography. It is one where you feel like it should be wrapping up any minute, and then you see, oh, it's got like 25 minutes left. Two hours is a little long, considering it isn't the most original Hellraiser movie in the world. It basically does take Hellraiser and turns it into a slasher movie about some young people running through a mansion. Though without the video game aspect of the Hell World Mansion movie. Even when this guy gets chained up, I'm still like, oh, he's gonna live. She's gonna offer Trevor as the sacrifice. See? Just put some Neosporin on those wounds. You're good! As for Voight, no, now how will he be a toy soldier at Santa's mall village? <laughs> Especially after the mall chandelier fell on him. Sadly, we have to say goodbye to Trevor. We all should have seen this coming. The Hellraiser movies are no place for characters named Trevor. And yes, Pinhead says the line. We have such sights to show you. Sweet, a hurricane. Sure, they could just leave and the movie would be over, but then she wouldn't be tempted by the Cenobites once more. Take my hand. Take me home. See, if Trevor were here, he'd say, don't do that. They tell her that now she has to live with regret and inner suffering. Like, okay, well, at least my skin's not inside out, and there's not a chain the size of a bridge piercing through my chest. Though I wasn't expecting the ending where Voight becomes the amazing colossal man. I may not be able to show you everything here, just know his flesh is peeled off to reveal his inner sequel baiting. Well, that movie was perfectly okay. It does feel like it should be in the late 2000s, early 2010s era of remakes, but had it been, it would have been one of the better ones. It does lack severely on the gore, which is weird for a Hellraiser movie. And it's like they had a stack of potential Hellraiser scripts and went with one that isn't bad, but fine and safe, unfortunately. But it does have solid acting and some suspenseful scenes, which does make it one of the best Hellraiser movies in a while. It's not better than the first two, and it is a tighter and less messier of a movie than the third and fourth. But the third and fourth are maybe more entertaining, and they are more original. The movie's also a little too long, though this movie's also original in that it didn't end with Pinhead screaming "No!" before exploding. The movie is available to watch on Hulu, and now that I got it over with, I can go back to what I'm really on Hulu for. The Frasier reruns! 